All right, thank you all for coming. We'd like to uh, call the meeting to order. And if you'd all stand and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I can ask you to remain standing for a moment of silence. Uh, this year's Fairfield of the Year, George Lacavera, uh, passed away last week. He's been somebody that, that uh, has been a good friend of, to many of us, has been involved in the town for a long time um, in many capacities, and is one of those volunteers that, that really shows the heart and character of our town. So if I could ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. All right. Uh, first up, Wednesday's Pat, Ms. Stenick. Okay. I always say this is the most humane portion of this meeting. <laughs> Ooh, thank you. She's got the audience right Hey, guys, she was knocking all of us. <laughs> 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 okay. This is um, a drug who is not available for at least for seven days because he was picked up recently and somebody may still claim him. He's about two years old, he's a Chihuahua. We have decided his name is Patty. And uh, so as I said, Patty will be available in about a week. He seems very friendly, very, was very good with children right before the meeting and uh, has been very attentive to what everybody's doing. So if you are interested in Patty, stop by in a week or a little bit before and put your name down if you're interested. And um, that's at 211 One Rod Highway, well, formerly One Rod Highway, now Richard White Way off of Reef, Reef Road. There's too many cars in that. Thank you. Sherry, now, are you still undefeated? We still have one, no, we still have Daisy, the pit bull mix. <laughs> Should, should. Everybody else has been adopted. I'm working on Daisy. Yeah. I haven't been able to do it yet, but I will adopt her myself if I have to. Just so everybody's clear, uh, Miss Stenick has been doing the Wednesday's pet for about a year and a half now. And what you just referenced is in, in all that time, there's only one pet that has not been adopted after being presented. Well, there are also four new kittens there that will be available soon, too, so just in case anybody wants okay. uh, want to. Yeah. And uh, Miss Stenick, one other comment from the board? This is a, a moment of personal privilege. Last month, when we missed you, and we were sorry to miss you, um, but we talked about you as leaving the WPCA. And tonight on the agenda, we have a reappointment for someone. So while you were here, I just wanted to say thank you for serving, remaining on that, and so many other things, and for all the ways that you have served the town. Very much. Thank you very much. All right, then first up uh, are the minutes. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second? Second for discussion purposes. Okay. Uh, do we have any discussion? Yes. I have an, we have an amendment. Um, speaking of Water Pollution Control Authority, uh, the minutes should read that Christian Do Dokum should be to replace Anita Rappaport, who resigned. And Mark Ellison should be to replace Sherry Stenick, who resigned. Okay. Jen, do you have those down? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we just crossed. Is there a second? I'll second that. For the amendment? Mm -hmm. any, <clears throat> any further discussion on that amendment or any further amendments? No. No, sir. Uh, all right. Uh, are we ready to vote on the amendment? Mm -hmm. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So the minutes stand before us as amended. Um, any further discussion on the minutes? No. Ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes pass. Next up, uh, reappointments. To hear, consider, and act upon the following reappointments <coughs> to the Water Pollution Control Authority. Uh, Brian H. Thompson, Republican, 137 Elm Street term uh, November 12th through November 16. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. All right. Any uh, comments, questions, or discussion? Mr. Thompson here? Okay. 
I, I will comment. As serving on the Water Pollution Control Authority with Mr. Thompson, he's a tremendous resource to us. Uh, he brings many years of background, but also professional expertise, so we're lucky to have him come back. Uh, good. Any follow-up discussion? No. Sure. Um, Mr. Thompson has served on the Water Pollution Control Authority in the past. Um, and uh, we are thrilled again that he would consider uh, serving again uh, in this capacity for our town. Any comments from the public on this appointment? Seeing none, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations, Mr. Thompson, in absentia. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Uh, Jen will get out a note on that. Okay, very good. Uh, next up, a banner request from the Fairfield Theater Company for Sherman Green. Uh, I'm not seeing anything in my packet on that. Did no, I? I didn't either. It was in the electronic. If you could share that, that would be good. Uh, All right. We've got the policy. Yeah, we'll All right. Is there somebody here from the theater company? Yeah. Uh, would you mind coming up, just introducing yourself and giving us uh, at the podium, if you would, please? That's that's where the microphone is. So if you could just um, move it out there. Good. Thank you. Chad Anderson, uh, Public Relations for Fairfield Theater Company. Uh, we are asking to put a banner up to help represent our upcoming show of the Fab Faux. And if anyone doesn't know what the Fab Faux is, they're one of the most elite tribute bands to the Beatles, where we have them coming to the Klein Auditorium because it's such a large act that we can't have it at stage one. And right now we have over 700 tickets sold right now, and we'd like to you know, let the town know that the FAFO are coming, and we know that it's a great spot right there on the green. Uh, people see the sign every day when they drive by, stuck in traffic. So we're asking for a request to have another banner up. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I know that as much as our policy says, we generally try and promote uh, activities in Fairfield and specifically downtown. Uh, we certainly have uh, shown support for the Fairfield Theater Company in the past to uh, help them in this economy to uh, continue to grow their their business and, and uh, support the arts and culture in our downtown. Absolutely. It's worthwhile to support, and um, I look forward to it. Yeah, I would echo that. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any comments from the public? All right. Back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. You. you have your banner. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, Riverfield School Building Committee to hear, consider, and uh, adopt the bond resolution entitled a resolution appropriating uh, 15150000 for the costs associated with the expansion and renovation of Riverfield Elementary School and authorizing the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation, a copy of which is attached here too. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second? Second. All right. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Quinn, did you have uh, some comments for us? Yes, I do. It's been a couple months since you've been back here. You okay? Uh, I'm Tom Quinn. I'm the chairman of the Riverfield uh, School Building Committee. Uh, I was here, uh, I guess, about three, four months ago, and we looked at our the plans that we had at that point in time. Uh, and we had uh, had a plan at that point that included uh, taking down the pod at Riverfield and building a two-story extension um, as the, we thought was the most practical use of the money. Before we went too much further after that, we needed to go and do soil testing. There was a concern with the soil. Um, and what we found out was the plan that we had. Uh, the soil was weak where we wanted to build the extension. So we then went back to the design drawing boards and pulled out the second best design that we had had, okay, which uh, had the uh, extension 
being built on the stronger soil that could take it. Uh, we then also met with Dr. Title and uh, the uh, education folks and looking at the amount of space that we had for in our educational specs. And we were able to um, sort of uh, uh, take a look at the specs and, and the way we interpreted them with Dr. Title and reduce 3,000 square feet. Uh, so combined with both of those, we then went full bore and looking at the cost for our project. And you will see the project in a few minutes. Uh, but we did extensive cost analysis. We hired Gilbay Company as our cost management firm. We already had SBS as our owner's rep, okay, along with the architect. So we, in fact, did have cost estimate done by two professional cost firms, plus overseen by SBS. Um, and what it really came down to is this $15 million project, no matter which way we turn, ended up being a $15 million project, okay? And uh, we took a hard look at all the numbers and recognizing that the town right now is as well as every other town uh, economically is uh, you know slow that we said hey is there something that we can do to trim this back last night at our committee meeting we voted to take away the air conditioning from the uh, building not the existing one but new air conditioning which is six hundred thousand and not to expand the gym which is 400000 or a total of a million dollars, okay? It was not done lightly. It was not done because we wanted to take away the AC, because we, all of us on the committee, felt strongly it should be there. However, in times when you have to look at the financial realities, you have to say, what can we afford to spend? And we're getting 24 classrooms, getting a remodeled school, okay, and we're getting an awful lot of good things for that school that is well deserved. And we need to keep this project going. You're gonna see in a few minutes, okay, from the architects, what's involved and what we have in that project. And uh, I think you'll be impressed, okay? and Kenneth Borson Architects. Um, we did, uh, as, as Tom uh, mentioned, uh, came up with these add alternates for the air conditioning and the gym extension. So it's out of the project based on the 14 million, but potentially would still be designed to see what happens when bids come in. But what I wanted to show you was last time we had taken down this pod and put in a two-story addition here based on what we assumed before we got soil testing that the berm here might have been filled and this would be good soil because there was a building on it. And what ended up happening is when we tested, it was actually the reverse. So uh, we decided because it was so important to be um, very uh, clear about what the cost was that we needed to do that geotech <coughs> testing prior to coming back here. So what that ended up doing it was it didn't make sense then to tear this down. And uh, based on the uh, reduction of the square footages in the ed spec that was, was approved, we were able to save the 3,000 square feet. So this addition got smaller, and there's a courtyard here, and there's a one-story piece behind. Now we're showing in this, because last night was the night where we talked about not extending the gym. So we're showing the gym extension here on these drawings that were but this, in fact, would not then actually. Just that corner. Just, just to piece. clarify, I think that's kind of what you're going to ask. The shaded portion is the new. And this is the addition. Okay. The darker shaded areas, yeah. and then this is the existing. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, to interrupt. I didn't mean to. No, you're good. Thank you. So, in the site the site plan, we were able to pull back uh, 
because of the, uh, actually, I guess it was Sandy, uh, they actually figured a way to get the, this to work without having a problem with the bus drop off and the parent drop off. So we were able to save pulling this parking back, not building a retaining wall, uh, which, which uh, caused additional savings. Can we stop on that for sure. a couple minutes? Yeah. I have a couple questions on the soil. Yeah. Can you just help me better understand the difference between good soil and bad soil and what possibilities were there for maybe moving bad to good, good to bad to utilize the space you wanted with different soil? Well, the in order to build on the bad soil, you need to go down 10 feet to the foundation below grade. Right. In order to build on good soil, you're three and a half feet to the frost line. So. Uh, it's not as simple as just moving soil around, it's what's there. So, in fact, it made the assumptions we initially made uh, had did not make sense in that case. In fact, when we came, back, came in front of you three or four months ago, we had a higher contingency on, the t on this scheme based on what we thought was bad soil here and a lower contingency on the scheme we presented. And then once we actually got the data, that threw the whole, that turned the whole thing around. Okay, so that's in reverse. Yeah. This is the plan as a result of that. Right. Um, the pod stays, the pod is on, quote, the bad soil. Right, but it's already, there, it's, built, it's built for that. It's built for that, so there's no danger to right. leaving the pod in place. There's no safety issues with that whatsoever. Right. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So going into the building, uh, I'll just take you through. Again, a small addition. We actually reduced the size of the vestibule here from the last time. But you're, it, it's very important for security purposes that you're able to go into a vestibule, have locked doors, be buzzed into the office, and then have to be buzzed into the school. This is a critical thing. We're seeing it on all our schools now, and this came out from the board of it as well. So we couldn't get rid of this vestibule. We needed to really keep this vestibule. We were able to pull in some of the square footage off of the side of this. And uh, again, this is the area that was decided last night not to construct the blue area here. See that? And so the new wing essentially is right along here, and then there's these classrooms along here. There's a couple of music rooms, the first grade, the kindergartens that they're going to reuse the existing kindergartens. And again, the square footage is. Uh, of those program spaces were reduced based on uh, the ed spec coming down. So initially those were a thousand square feet and so we had to show all four new kindergarten classes because you couldn't fit it in. Now they're going to keep two of those classes and we're going to build two more. So again the kindergartens, first grade, second grade, third grade, the fourth grade there's one here and three in the pod in the fourth, fifth, fourth, fifth grade. And there's a variety of resource rooms and bathrooms and art room stays where it is. Uh, some new toilets here for the gym. Uh, the renovated uh, health suite. And then we're taking out the stage in here to get adequate seating in the uh, cafeteria. We're adding space to the kitchen, which was re really needed because it wasn't working. And we're adding a second kitchen line within the kitchen. And last time we did not have that in there and they just said this was essential for the working of the school. So that got added back in. As well as last time we didn't have removing the stage and that was essential. So there were a couple of things that came back as we went through, but significant amount of space that was saved. In this area of the pot, if you're familiar, there's kind of this open area. We're going to use that as a resource room. So that'll get enclosed and it won't look so messy in the pot. Any questions? Yeah, sorry. Yes, please. Um, you might recall when we first looked at this a few months back, there was, um, there was an analysis that was done for us, and then it was in one of the information packets that we got, and then we had it revised, and you guys went back and did some extra work on it. And what it basically was showing in a spreadsheet format was the, old, the current school versus the new project. You know, there was numbers of rooms, there was additions, there was square footage, there was another, a, a, a number of different metrics in there showing the before and the after and the proposed and the, you know there was some 
you know, puts and takes there, but we were trying to figure out how many classrooms we were gaining and all. Right, yeah, and all that, that was confusing based on the last time, right? Right. Is there a similar analysis? I didn't see it in here, but is there a similar? We do have one. I, we didn't. Spreadsheet we had that, that spreadsheet. Kind of we don't have it. We don't have it here, but we did do one. We can provide it for you. Right, because it was like sixty-seven thousand square yeah, feet. Yeah, this is now sixty-three thousand square feet. It, so it would be helpful to understand all of those metrics yeah. where we were, what we're getting, and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, very definitely. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, yes. Sorry. Any other questions? Probably makes sense to ask some questions. I don't want to interrupt the presentation. That's okay. Too much of a distraction. I mean, the only other thing I have here, uh, well, in terms of the drawings, uh, George can go through the specific programming issues, but is the renderings. So if there's questions you want, if you want to see the renderings, I can show them to you and then ask a question. Why don't you go ahead and yeah. go through the rest okay. of it, then we get the yeah. full so, picture first. Thanks. Uh, you know, this is the new entrance. This is basically just a piece that's being added here. I guess I could use the pointer instead of putting my hand in. This is pretty much looking the same, it's the pod. There's the addition on the back. Again, it's picking up the same kind of style that's there here and it's stepped back. Initially, when we had our original uh, scheme of this kind, this was actually extended further because of the square footage was higher and it was very aesthetically problematic. So kind of pushing it back has helped the aesthetics of that. And then, again, this no longer, because we have the addition shown here on this, Gym. This is something that changed last night, so this gym will be shorter. Again, that addition that it'll end right there, just as it is now. There's no change to the gym. Uh, so, do you want to go through the program? You want to hear the program element first, or do you want sort of the summary, or do you want to ask questions? Uh, I would suggest that your presentation, so however you think it's Let's best for us summary. to understand. Let's do the summary and then. Be to answer questions. Hi, George Gattinger. I'm with Ken Borison. Uh, and essentially, the metrics that you were referring to are summarized in the handouts that you, you've received. It doesn't have the quid pro quo comparison, mm -hmm. but the net effect of what's in the building as to what we're adding, what we're altering, and the site work is summarized in these sheets. So from the addition side, uh, the driving force here is to get rid of the portable classrooms. So those five rooms in those two buildings will be removed. Uh, we're basically expanding the building to accept four classrooms for each grade level. That's a total of 24 classrooms by grade where we currently only have 21. Uh, we're going to develop additional program space to accommodate the resource rooms, OT, PT, uh, teaching environments, the gang toilets that Ken previously pointed out in the renderings as well as the displaced facilities due to the addition. Uh, <coughs> the existing gymnasium uh, was going to be expanded for the assembly purposes that was part of the uh, Board of Ed requirements. This is now going to be bid as an ad alternate. This is one of the things that we're taking out of the project to reduce the project cost from 15 to 13.99. So when we, if we successful in getting this approved through the entire town process, We'll create a separate set of documents that will be bid separately. And if our budget bids come in, great. We'll have the money to build it. We can build it. Uh, replace the lost storage areas due to the gymnasium expansion. <clears throat> That's on the side of the building. We still need requirements for mechanical spaces. Uh, we also have to uh, replace uh, classroom displacement due to the central office. The central office and nurse suite are being pushed into the classroom adjoining it. So that's going to be displaced and we need to create space within the building, which is why we have additional rooms out in that addition. Uh, we're expanding the kitchen to, to create additional cooler freezer space. And one of the driving forces to make the school operate effectively is two serving lines. Uh, they can't get the kids in and out quickly enough to eat comfortably with one serving line. So the renovation is going to give them the two serving lines that they need to function properly. <coughs> And we're also going to create space for the required code upgrades, which is primarily uh, sprinklers. Part of the addition, we'll have a new sprinkler room. We're going to bring water service. We need to increase the electric service due to the size of the school. It currently has 1,000 amps. We would need 3,000 if we build in the capacity for the future air condition that we have. So on the plan that Ken showed, the addition off to the side was for that. Uh, the alterations that we list here, uh, we're going to expand the cafeteria for additional seating 
by taking the existing gym out so there'll be more kids space for the kids to eat comfortably. We're going to do all the abatement required for asbestos lead and PCB in the areas uh, that we're touching in the building. Wherever we're doing demolition work to create our additions, they will all be abated. We're going to alter the kitchen, as I said, for the two serving lines. We have to expand the central office to, to provide the secure visitors control, ADA staff toilets, and, the, and the, a, a better nurse's office. The nurse's office is basically one, one room. Uh, the pod will be reconfigured to get a better central core area. Uh, we're going to upgrade non-existing, uh, the existing non-compliant ADA toilets to, to be compliant. Uh, we're going to replace all the existing classroom millwork and sinks because the sinks are not ADA compliant and the millwork is well past its cell date. Uh, we're going to replace all the existing corridor ceilings and lights which will be necessary to install our ventilation and our sprinkler systems. So we'll take them down put in our support systems and then put the ceiling and lights back. All the lockers will be replaced. Uh, again, the central air conditioning throughout all the occupied spaces is going to be combined and bid as an add alternate. When you do an add alternate, you create a separate set of documents independent of what you're getting your numbers on and you say, give me a price for this. And if we can afford it, we'll include it. Uh, under the current scenario, the existing air conditioning will stay. The pods air conditioned, the gym is air conditioned, the media center is air conditioned, uh, the office will get new air conditioning if it gets reconfigured. Uh, and you'll see a little a later on in the, uh, another add alternate for air conditioning the multi-purpose room. Uh, provide central air conditioning in the all-purpose room only. There's bid alternate number three. That was that's, that's not a list of priorities, by the way. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, we're going to replace all the existing classroom lighting with high efficiency daylighting and control fixtures. Uh, the thin tube radiation valves will be replaced along with all the controls. That's 14, 15 are the sprinklers. 16 is replaced the outdated gym floor. That will become part of the add alternate for expanding the gym. If we don't expand the gym, we won't replace the floor. Uh, <clears throat> the wood cafeteria, the, the uh, the wood floor in the cafeteria will be replaced because once you take out the stage, uh, you have to put a new finish on the floor there. And that floor is, again, well past its cell date. But we're not going to put wood back. We're going to put VCT back because it's more economical. Uh, updated security systems, new technology is all going to be taken care of. Uh, the roofing work, as required for air conditioning, will become part of the add alternates. We're not going to do anything if I don't have any air conditioning as is the requirement for the structural supports. Uh, the site revisions that Ken showed you on the drawings, the portable classrooms will be gone. We're going to reconfigure the north parking area to accommodate the building expansion, drainage upgrades, and additional parking. We're going to wind up with 113 parking spaces, by the way. Uh, new security access drive along the rear of the building, which is the west side, uh, and additional landscaping. Uh, the priority order for these alternates uh, the committee directed us to, uh, to, to consider the most important priority on these add alternates would be adding air conditioning to the multi-purpose room. Uh, the second most important priority would be air conditioning the rest of the building. And the third most important priority would be uh, the expansion of the gym. We numbered them as they occurred on the sheets. That's why it came out differently. <laughs> okay. uh, when you're listing add alternates, where are they? Are they listed all in one place? Uh, no, you have to add alternate number one for the gym is number four under building additions. Okay. Uh, add alternate number two is item 10 under alterations. And add alternate number three for the uh, all purpose room is item 11 on the alteration sheet. My apologies for that. We just did that last night. And the follow-up work that's in uh, at alternates uh, two and three are items 20 and 21. That work that is work that would be associated with with the at alternates. Okay, I've got 20. I don't have a 21. Structural supports? No. We have 19 and 20. Really? Mm -hmm. This is what we sent out. Which was the same. Oops. Glad to give you this copy if it matters. So it's 19 and 20 on our sheet, it looks like. Right. 19 is the roofing and 20 is the structural. 
Oh, okay. That's what mine reads. Right. If that's the case, what are we missing that's yeah. there? I don't know. Uh, the 19 on my sheet is providing updated security systems, which that's is what you don't have. No, that's 18. That's 18 on yours? Yeah. Security, yeah. 19 is roof, 20. Yeah. 13 DDS controls. 14 is DDS. Fin tube radiation. Hang on. We do not have your number 11 up here. Existing classroom lighting? No. Yeah. Provide so central room. Room. Provide central air at all purpose room. I'm not seeing that one here. Okay. Yeah, we split it. We split it out as a separate item because that was that's last evening was determined to be an important uh, priority. So, so it reads, Kristen. If you want me to read it to you? No, I actually okay. have a question. Okay. Just to, if you go back in terms of the order of prioritization of those ad alternates. I think I, I got those. Can you briefly run through that? The most important priority is putting central air conditioning into the all okay. multi-purpose room, the all-purpose room, because okay. that would give them their primary assembly areas that have conditioned spaces. It will be the gym, uh, the multimedia center, and uh, the all-purpose room. The second order of priority and importance is going to be putting back the air conditioning in the rest of the building. Uh, and the third order of importance would be expanding the gym. Get that right down. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. Well, that's different than what. Right. I've got. That's why I was asking. I had number one at alternate being expand existing gymnasium for school assembly purposes. What what I was trying to say is that they were sequentially numbered from the top down, but it's not the order of importance. That's okay. That's so the, the, order, the order. Why don't we of try it? Order of importance. The order that's of importance, good. as I said. The number one importance is the APR rule. Air conditioning, yeah. the APR rule. All right, okay. So that's, that's the one the, that we didn't that's have. The one that you don't have? That's the one I just penciled in as 21 on my sheet. Okay. So it reads provide uh, central air conditioning for, for all purpose room, yeah. bid as alternate. But here it says bid as add alternate number three. Does that not matter? No. That does not matter. No, no. Okay, so at, in, in order of importance, that's it. Yes, that's sir. the first one. Okay. okay, I got it. And what's number two? Number two is. Complete the rest of the air conditioning throughout the building. Okay. And number three? Is enlarge the gymnasium. Okay. Okay. Number four? We have three. That's three. it. Oh. Okay. Replace all existing classroom lighting, high efficient lift. That wasn't part of that? No, no. sir. And the roofing work is required, placement of new AC. Structural support space. See, that's not. That'll be bundled in with the air conditioning alternate, so that becomes part of that alternate. So then, that's part of number one. Uh, order of importance, priority would be two. Two. Uh, yeah. That's the, that's the main central air conditioning. I think what Mike is asking is, do do those two items get linked to number one or linked to number two? On the order of priority, correct. Or linked to two. Linked to two. They're linked to two, so you could do one without 19 and 20, is what you're saying, or without whatever the numbers. Yes. Are. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk about the budget then? Do you have any other questions relative to this? Uh, yes, uh, but. but Come back to it. Thought yeah. is that yeah. I thought we agreed you'd finish your presentation, oh. then we we come back once we had a complete picture. Can you revise Thank you. Uh, budget? Thank you. Oh, thanks. So this will align with the uh, the board we have here. So my name is Mark Skalenka from Strategic Building Solutions. Um, nice to see you all again. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the process and how we got to the numbers you're looking at, uh, both before today and just just a moment ago. Um, with the revised or tweaked ed specs in hand, with the understanding of the phasing and the soils and the scheme that the design team and the building committee adopted, we solicited the services of the architect's estimator as well as the construction manager, Gilbane, hired by the town to provide an estimate. 
uh, both firms provided, so you're looking at very you know, simple sheets, but both firms provided very detailed uh, estimates uh, that we reviewed in the Gilbane office over the course of two days, uh, spending hours upon hours uh, reviewing the numbers. They came in in an analysis form that looked like this, and I don't expect you to read it, but you can see where we lined up the numbers side by side based upon the various trades. Um, all questionable or um, differences were resolved during the, that course of that reconciliation meeting. During that time, we also solicited value engineering ideas in, with values, uh, so the air conditioning, uh, the gym expansion, all those sorts of items uh, came with associated values. That was done in concert between the two estimators. All of that resulted in the number that you're looking at here today for total construction of $11,178,000. Um, the number you saw yesterday was a little bit different, obviously, than that. It was $12 million, but as the result of the building committee's decision last night, we're now reporting a total construction of just over $11 million for the scheme that you looked at uh, a moment ago. The FF&E, the furnitures, the fixtures and equipment uh, has not changed because we're still putting in the same furniture in, in the new classrooms. So that largely remained the same. Fees and expenses largely remained the same. Construction contingency, because you have a CM on board, was moved to the construction line item. So now built into this $11.1 million is a construction contingency that the CM would have within their contract. That's roughly 4% of that number. And then you've got the owner's project contingency, which covers uh, scope adjustments um, that are unforeseen at this, at this point. So with all of the numbers uh, we have at hand, uh, with confidence, we can say the total project uh, for the scheme we're looking at today is just under $14 million. Just to uh, the fees and expenses, 1.77 million. That's about 15 percent in rough math. What's uh, included in that? Architect fees, uh, CM pre-construction fees, uh, commissioning, owners' representatives, um, legal fees, printing, consultant reimbursables, bond origination fees. Um, what am I missing? Those are the big ticket items, anyways. Okay. There's advertisements. Um, okay, and in, there wasn't a comparison to kind of what we were presented before to kind of see what changed from a cost standpoint. In terms of the fees and expenses or the overall Just cost? The overall. Well, the overall cost, the construction, what you saw the last time went down about a million dollars. Um, <coughs> And the contingency, well, again, the fees and expenses largely remain the same, um, and the project contingency remained the same. But it was really all in this line item right here, the deltas between the December 20th uh, meeting and, and today. And just um, how were the ad alternate items uh, determined? One of the one of the points from the January presentation was that the uh, specs um, that this project did everything in the specs and that it was hard to get it done for less because the specs laid it out. It looks like some of these things have now been pulled out. So my question is, what is it that allows those to get pulled out from the specs, if unless the specs have changed? We, we in fact, the committee, okay, took it upon ourselves last night to change the specs. Okay, by taking out the air conditioning, okay, and the enlarged gym. And the note that I said to you today, we need to go to Dr. Title and get their approval from the board then. But the only way we can get this down is by changing the scope. Okay? That's the only way that we were allowed. We went through every single trade estimate, every single cost estimate, and what was left is the scope of the project. And instead of just laying it out there and saying, well, you choose what you want to take out, we felt it was incumbent that we make a decision and hand you what our collective judgment was. And that was that the AC 
and the large chip the two items of substantive value that will make a significant change in the cost. Yeah, and, and Mr. Quinn, again, I, I want to be clear that you made you were very clear in your January presentation that the building committee had done everything they could uh, in terms of coming in with a project that met the specs uh, and that was the cost that was laid out. So the reason for the question was when looking at the change, did the specs change or did we find some other opportunities? Certainly because you went out and did some additional testing, checked the, uh, the, the ground as was described earlier, that may have led to some cost efficiencies, but it's really what you're describing is in essence, by changing the specs, yeah. you're able to, to reduce the cost on this. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't mean to... Sir, I just have one thing that I want to add relative to the cost savings. One of the uh, strategies we developed was uh, the acceleration of the construction period. Right now, the way it's scheduled out with uh, funding approval, EDO 49 submission to the state, grant approval next uh, summer of 2014, completing the documents, bidding, the anticipation originally was to start construction in June of 2015. Um, one of the strategies we came up with was to start construction June of 2014, basically saving a year of escalation. What we're seeing in the industry is a tremendous, not tremendous, but an uptick in escalation in construction. And it was a significant savings to um, to try and shoot for an earlier start of construction, even in advance of the EDO 49 approval, with the understanding that you can start the work, you just can't get reimbursed until the EDO 49 is approved. So that is one of our strategies, and it's another component yeah, of the, dollars. yeah. That's a good half, yeah. That's a good half a million dollars off the front. <coughs> okay, and, and which line under the half a million dollars come out of? It's all under here. It's all under construction. Uh, was this reviewed with the finance department to see the impact on cash flow and, and what we call our waterfall chart and, and how that's played out? Not just shown to go. Yeah. Okay. I don't mean to go right ahead. Um, the FFNE, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. What what is what are the things included in there? I I know. Tables and chairs, teachers' desks, uh, conference room tables and chairs, uh, projectors. Um, no, lockers are part of the base construction. Yeah, that was one of my questions. Actually. Yeah, no, lockers are part lockers. of the base construction. Um, <coughs> that's pretty much, pretty much it. So, is generally is FF and A, and I probably should know this from before, things that are movable? Yes. So, mm -hmm. lockers being. Yeah, I mean, you could have some custom mill work that's considered furniture that gets attached, but that's usually in a media center where you have our circulation desk or something of that size, but everything that we're talking about with this project would be loose furniture that could get moved around. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Can I go back to the gym for a minute? The Can plan? You, um, I don't, yeah, you could put it up there if you don't mind, please. Sure. I'm curious. That might be the wrong guy to answer your question. Sure, well, mm -hmm. whoever can answer. I'm, I'm just curious as, you know, since we, this just happened last night with a reduction in the gym size, so my, I guess my questions are, what was it before size-wise, what is it now, um, and what impact does that have on capacity or ability to deliver the program within the school, since it looks like it's a pretty good chunk, if I'm looking at that corner correctly, right? Well, Did I, I miss? I don't have a scale here, but... Uh, How much of that is the gym in, in that corner blue? Right here. It, yeah, it's, it, it's the whole square up there, so that's... It's a pretty good chunk, right? The green is the end of the existing gym. Right, beyond right. Beyond that, there is a 10-foot addition that's a storage area right here. Just beyond that, mm -hmm. it's taken down to expand that. Uh, so, so it's a good. This is uh, this is this. These are six. So that's like six, twelve, eighteen, twenty-four, about twenty-eight feet. So, feet. let me ask it a different way. Putting the storage aside for the moment, which is something else how much less gym space is there today than there was when this was drawn gym space 30 feet by the width of the gym I'd say that's probably about 30 by 50 let's say 30 I'm by guessing about 1500 mm -hmm. feet we, we, we reviewed the function of the gym with right. the school staff last night 
and they said they're comfortable with they can conduct two classes in the gym simultaneously with the younger kids and, and this is not anything we did in a vacuum it was discussed with Brenda the principal and, and they were comfortable with the process and again we still have to go back to Dr. Title and run it through the board of ed right. but it's nothing we did cavalierly or in a vacuum no and I, I'm not suggesting that but since it's the recent development I'm just wondering how big the gym was how big the gym right. is proposed to now be and what the impact of that is that's my question when, when we're looking at ways to save money and you think about the fact that 30 feet Adding on, now you've got to change all the basketball hoops that you know, you've got to get it all stretched out. So yep. now you're doing all that. You're changing all the floor. You're right. changing all the air conditioning because it's air conditioned now. It's a significant amount of savings that's related to that that doesn't necessarily affect the overall sort of program of the school. And that's why I think uh, Brenda came to this individually without us even discussing it, I believe. Earlier in the day, it's like, maybe we can live with the gym the way it is. That's how it came about. Okay. If I may follow up. Um, I'm just trying to understand this because there's a lot of new information here. So, and obviously the school needs a ton of work and this project needs to move forward in some form at some time. And I'm, I'm good with all of that. But what I'm struggling with here is now I've got three data points in my mind. I have the school as it is and then and then and I'm thinking of this in kind of a report that I'd like to see and the next column over would be similar to what we did in the past which was the 15 million dollar project that we looked at early January it had it had all of these things there were all of these differences between what the school has and what this project now is which was our first choice it was choice a before we learned about the soil and, yeah. and all these other things right? right and then we have this new project which is which wasn't choice A, but still might be a great choice, with things flipped around and things moved around. And now in, in, in this column C, whatever you, you want to call it, now we have all of these components and all these variances to what we have today, and also the variances to what we looked at in December or January, because you know it, it, it might have been 22 classes, 28 classes, 24 classes, and I just don't know where we've, we how to look at this apples to apples current what we looked at and seemed to like versus what we're looking at today just to kind of get a just to kind of get a good clear understanding of the process yeah we have that yeah okay that would be helpful you got the old comparison oh okay because of the change last night right yeah so we you have some well, I just follow a comment to that. I think we did. We spent a lot of time talking about that last time. We did, and I, I did. I mean, I know we asked for something um, like that follow up, and I think it would be great to see. Just, I think last time a big piece of the conversation was obviously earlier in the process when there wasn't as much information available, and when um, there was kind of an initial conversation before you were involved and the change in the square footage of new construction being significant and trying to understand what the new spaces were. I, I feel like it would be very helpful to this process for us to, to be looking at that, so I, I concur. Um, I also, you know, I, I think what Selectman Kylie said that I agree with completely that, that this project needs to move forward. I think he said in some form and at some time, and I think, you know, that was well put because we there are a lot of I think there are some specific questions and those that being a, a big one for me um, I think there are also some other larger conversations for this table today or um, sometime soon that are kind of broader issues but I well, would like to see the specific questions I don't have anything else specific at this moment Kevin, okay if I ask a few? Absolutely, thank you. Just uh, getting back, there, one of the questions that came up in January was uh, six classrooms in the portable, which was part of the original uh, preliminary presentation going back a year to 16 classrooms in January. We referenced 24 here. How, did, how do these numbers kind of relate to where we are? The, the existing school has 21 elementary school grade classrooms, okay. K through five. 
The five classrooms that are in the modulars, I believe, are used for music uh, and other uh, uh, infrequently used. So they're not considered part of the core elementary classrooms. The charge is 24 classrooms, so there's an increase of four. Uh, 24 core grades. Uh, so there's, there's an increase there. And when we modify the interior of the plan, you lose a classroom here because we have to create access into the addition. You lose a classroom here because of the health suite expansion. There's two more. You lose what is a third grade classroom here becomes a music room or a science room. So to accommodate the science and music spaces within the rooms, you're losing additional classrooms. So uh, I can't give you the total count of spaces. It hasn't changed from the other scheme because we're meeting the same requirements for the Board of Ed, requirements for their uses, OTP, PT spaces, resource rooms. They're all being housed within the addition, which generates the need for getting this to be more than five classrooms. Well, one of the, the, the reasons for that confusion at the time was the 6 versus 16 number and, and looking for the growth. Because because we were tearing the pods down, yeah. which had seven spaces in it, so when you build your two-story addition, you're replacing the seven plus what you needed for right. for the replacement of that. This is a much simpler, straightforward, linear. <laughs> okay, and, and again, I think as we've been trying, we're trying to get a kind of comparison to, to where we were. I don't know, um, and it's looking at the different breakouts. We've got uh, item three here describes uh, resource rooms, OT and PT teaching environments, um, and uh, I'm going to say displaced facilities. I'm going to assume that's not classroom space, but it's just it's just trying to get a handle on the, the total number of spaces in comparison to the two. Because I'm what I'm getting the other piece of that, or where that comes from, is the amount of, I think there was like 30,000 square feet of new construction that we talked about in January, and roughly the same amount of renovation work being done for a total in, in the 60 to 70,000 so, range. We're now 67, we're now at 63, right. we're at 19,000 yeah. new, yeah. approximately at 40, <clears throat> 40. And, and yeah. somewhere both those numbers had grown considerably over what the original well, plan listen, or toward. 18,000 square feet of new, new addition. Renovating heavily, uh, 15,000 square feet, and the rest of the building is considered a moderate renovation at 29,000 square feet. So the existing building is 45 round numbers, plus our addition brings you to like 62.9, which will be the finished square footage of the entire project. Now that again was with the gym expansion. So, so, it's, so it's going to be less than that if we don't expand the gym. I think the gym expansion was 1,700 feet. There was a chart in there that we had from last 30 night. 30 by 20 or 30 by 50, I think. Yeah, I was, was just guessing. So that's 1,500, give or take. Yeah. No, it's got the okay. square footage on it. Right. Now, did, did the change in renovation change the cost per square foot in terms of making up some of these numbers? Uh, I don't believe so because we're doing the same amount of re interior renovation work. Okay, so you're just breaking up the heavy renovation the heavy, the heavy renovation normal areas. renovation this time that's just not that's just different than what we heard in well January I'm not sure if we broke it out that way. I don't I don't think so I'm just yeah. trying to is yeah, that right. a difference or is that just we didn't get that breakout you probably didn't get that kind of a definition the, the heavy renovation is when you're into a space and you're taking partitions down and you're subdividing it like this area and the area where the office is uh, the light renovation of the existing spaces where you're doing ceiling work sprinklers <coughs> bringing in ductwork kind of thing where you're not really tearing the space apart. Okay. Um, uh, you mentioned removing the stage. Is there going to be a stage in the, the newly configured building? There is going to be a performance area. There's when no stage. There's, there's, there's no stage. No. Short answer is no. Yeah. no. Uh, okay. You see the way we did the layout. We didn't extend the seating all the way out. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's going to be sufficient space, hopefully, to accommodate seating and performance space, but not on a raised platform. This was one of the cost considerations, the cost for building ramps and elevating the floor. Uh, again, we're trying to be economical. Uh, and again, this was vetted with the, uh, the school staff. No, I um, um, just want to be clear. I heard about it moving, and, and I didn't hear about it getting put back in, so I wanted to be... Right. Uh, 
they need the space for the seating in the cafeteria. Can I follow up on that? Sure. On, on the stage, um, since there isn't a stage in this proposal, um, have you guys looked at any, are there any like movable stages or are there any things that you can use as a stage? Can you talk about that? Just say what other options there might be so that there is quote a stage when needed but may not always be there? But yeah, in the FF&E budget there are the, the platforms that you could buy that you could store in a storage room and then when you have a performance, break them out, piece them together and have a bit of a six inch, eight inch elevated platform if you will. And then when you're done, fold them up, stuff them in a closet. Mm -hmm. Those hey, are can, can you refresh my memory on the previous plan? Was there a raised stage yes. in yes. that plan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that that would be another item for review by the Board of Ed for Ed Specs and oh, things yep. that may or may not be consistent with what program they want to deliver. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then can somebody talk? It, it mentions in here about technology for a new teaching environment. Can somebody talk about what that technology is? Sorry. Technology for a new teaching environment. It's item. Oh, I saw it, yeah. 17 on our list at 17. Well, in the new edition, we'll be bringing in all new technology that matches what the current school has for smart boards, wireless data outlets. There's an, uh, a new tech closet we would have to build here to serve the edition. So it's not necessarily changing the technology within the existing spaces, but we're going to make it all comply and have a comprehensive system that meets the current requirements for technology. Okay, so how many smart boards are we bringing in? Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to have that many smart boards, but technology is everything from a projector to a screen um, to a smart board. You know, okay. there, I, we haven't gotten to the point of identifying specifically smart boards versus bright links versus other sort of you know EV technology components. All right, we do have some bonding guidelines in terms of what technology. The, uh, our town policy allows to be bonded or not. So one very clear question, and, and uh, I, I guess it's how much money is included in this for that type of technology, what it is, uh, and uh, we need to have that clarified. Yes. Okay. I think I, I'm getting indications that there's some conversation that has yet to happen in terms of the specifics, and that's what I actually heard Mr. Skalenka, is that right? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, the, you haven't gotten to that level of clarification. So I think um, I would just rephrase it as a statement, I think, just to reiterate, you know, that we, as the building committee, I think, is aware, and certainly the central office and members of the Board of Ed you know, follow mm -hmm. the agreed upon guidelines yep. that mm -hmm. Mr. Tetra is referring to. So I may I have a. Well, actually, question? I just, the, the point is, is on the other side of that is that how much does that reduce the cost of this? Because if we're not going to bond those items, they're not in this resolution, they're not part of this project. So that would be one of the follow-up points for that. Sorry, go right ahead. Well, I think that was part of my question is, when I think about technology to a classroom, I think about capability. So maybe not necessarily the specific hardware, such as a smart board, but it's that capability, the wiring, um, those things. Back, I assume backbones, the backbones will be installed as part of this work. The wiring, the cable trays, data outlets that will give the flexibility of communicating whatever equipment that we can anticipate, whether it's a smart board or a projector. Okay. And that's, I mean, that to me, that would be forward thinking that we're looking at who knows, you know, is, is it a smart board? Is it something else as we go through time and 50 years from now when? not any of us but another group is sitting in this room that we've done the right thing for them for the long-term vision on that so um, on tech on the wiring and the cabling and the networking and all that stuff does that cost end up in construction or is that in the IT component section Usually it's in construction. yeah the wiring and the infrastructure is part of construction that's all the part physical of construction. device is part of the technology and the other question I had on, if, well, if I didn't want to jump off the no, IT if you're exhausted that topic, okay, um, yeah. is, you know, we talked about how much is new construction, how much is lightly renovated, how much is significantly renovated. Um, at what point do we take the plan with those estimates on square footage in estimated expenses back to the finance department? 
to be evaluated for potential reimbursement. Like this bucket is not reimbursed, this is a maybe, these we know we get some percentage of, just to kind of get a ballpark feel for on the overall $15 million, are we looking at 12% or 20% potential reimbursement from the state? Um, I think perhaps if you would come up, Mr. Collins, could you address that perhaps? Um, it might be early in the stage, but or if Mr. Marvito, sure, thank good. you. And if you can't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you can't tell us how that process would work, it, uh, oh, no, yeah. give some more background to Mr. Kiley's question. Hi, Sal Marvito, manager of construction. Um, BSF reimbursement for this project. Um, number one, you do get it. Um, the net reimbursement that you would get on a renovation project like this, going by past history, would be roughly 20 to 22 percent of the, the total cost. Our reimbursement rate is 26 point something percent right now. Mm -hmm. So based on that, there's a certain portion of the items that are within here that would be considered repair or non-eligible items for reimbursement. The net effect is you, the town would end up with 20 to 22 percent reimbursement on an addition renovation of this nature. You feel comfortable with that estimate as as sure. today? Okay. Sure. And how soon in the process do you do a detailed analysis of that to kind of get that number closer? Because there are different types of work being done that qualify at different rates. And I know you're blending it for 2022, which may make sense in the end, right? But I just don't know how it how it adds up to get there. Uh, it takes a, it, it. You don't know what the final number is until you you file the final change order and you close out all the documents and you have an audit. Right. Um, that being said, uh, once the construction documents are bid out and we actually see each individual subcontractor's cost, mm -hmm. we can then pull out, call out the items that are non-eligible, partially eligible, things like that, right. to file an updated what they call an ineligible cost worksheet. So we, we will know which ones they're not right. reimbursing on early on. That's without, that's before change orders, unforeseen things like that. Right. But overall, um, going by uh, both high school expansion projects, Tomlinson, mm -hmm. um, Stratfield, you're, you're running 20 to 22 okay. percent. Thank you. And just to be fair, it, um, based on my brief experience back in um, on the reimbursement subcommittee we had back on the RTM. It's mm -hmm. not as black and white as you would think from right. this side of the table, Mr. Morby. Uh, I really <laughs> wish it was a lot more black and white. <laughs> I'm sure different. of that. And when he says partials, what he really means is negotiation. Yeah. Uh, in right. terms of what's included, what that isn't. Is true. Um, I, so that's that's a much more challenging job than just filling out the forms. And yes, it is. And yes, a lot it is. of horses. So, yes. I, thank you. Thanks, Sal. So. Uh, could uh, just on the issue of security, and I know we can't get into it, so I'm not. As, but I, has this been reviewed with our police department? I, I know they're doing security surveys at the existing facilities. Did they have a chance to look at this comment and were their comments included in what you have here? Yeah. I've, I've been in conversation with Chief Liddy, okay, and we're going to sit down with these guys and go through them microscopically to be sure they are consistent. Okay, but he knows what we're doing with the best of you and the cameras. Okay, but we need to go through it on a more meticulous basis. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, just a few specifics um, in terms of ADA accessibility and um, specifically with respect to the non compliant item number six on my alteration list. Um, how many of those? alterations need to be made in the building how many ADA non-compliant currently the there? existing staff toilets in the administrative area are non-compliant there's a couple of other toilet rooms affiliated with the, uh, uh, the janitorial suite that are non-compliant uh, there's three existing toilets within the existing first grades that are non-compliant that we would be taking out uh, the core facilities outside uh, the media center are compliant, and the toilet facilities within the pod are compliant, and they shouldn't require work. So there's essentially the single staff toilets uh, that need to be upgraded. They're, they're virtually closet-sized. 
Just to follow up on that, the first grade, I noticed something. It's I would I'll say code speak, not meaning building code, but the uh, I guess it was in the plumbing water closets lavatory can you explain the difference and is that the kindergarten because you're removing some but redoing others i was reading Let's see if i can find it basically basically the, the three first grade classrooms that would be left it's basically a toilet in a closet <laughs> it's literally a three and a half foot wide stall and the sink is outside the space in the classroom so because they're not required for the change in the program, uh, we're going to be building new toilets in our kindergarten spaces that will be ADA compliant. To get more space within the classroom, we're just going to demo and remove them. Okay. And whatever sinks remain within the spaces will become ADA accessible because we're going to change out the millwork. So they'll have the appropriate knee space and clearance is required. Um, and that's another question actually that I had just in terms of millwork, which was. Is all of the millwork replacement associated with the ADA sink? Uh, essentially, they need to be accessible, but the millwork is really worn. Uh, if you look at photos on the facilities report that we did, the, the veneers are split, the laminate's falling apart. Uh, it's time they should be replaced. And we were asked our opinion whether they should be reused or replaced, and we suggested to include it in the scope of the renovation. Well, you understand, of course, I'm asking, as I'm sure the building committee has discussed that as well. Um, and then same kind of question with the lockers. I know at Fairfield Woods, we just did a very extensive renovation. We were not able to replace all of the lockers there, uh, to the chagrin of some, perhaps some of the students. Um, what is the condition of the lockers? What kind of cost is the locker replacement? And can you tell us a I little bit about the new 500 there. lockers? I think we have a cost of about $225 per. Uh, all the lockers within the old building date back, I believe, to the original construction. The doors are falling off the hinges. Uh, they're the old fashioned two, two door lockers. The kids have to double up within them because there's not enough of them. So uh, the idea is to put back 500 single use lockers. There's an issue of lights, right? Wasn't there an issue yeah. when you share? Well, health issues because kids are sharing lockers. Yeah. <laughs> Just is the that's two hundred times five hundred. Yes. yes. So that's a million dollars on that. No, hundred thousand dollars. Hundred thousand dollars. That's built into the cost budget. Okay. I'll go in the locker business. Jeez, don't scare me. Yeah, it's pretty good, huh? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, no, I just because the a lot of the locker projects. Um, I know Chairman now at Clearfield Woods and some other schools have been split out from um, this kind of renovation project. Right. So the, to make sure I heard you correctly then, the millwork is it's associated with the sinks, but it's more than that. Yes. It's, yes, yes. Definitely it's definitely beyond. Mm. Okay. Uh, any other so questions? Just, I, just, I have a couple. Go ahead. Could you just speak a little bit to, you know, we have a significant change here from building two stories over here to building more on the back, right? Can you just speak a little bit to um, what effects that's going to have on the back of the school, whether it's playground area or whether it's play areas? Are we encroaching on anything that we don't want to or didn't want to in the past? And what is the net effect of all of that? Site plan. Mm -hmm. This is the existing playground, so mm -hmm. it's not affected by anything. Right. Okay. Uh, the existing modulars basically sit sit here and yeah. here, so it'll be taken out. So you pick up that space. Okay. So yep. this yep. is currently a paved outside recreational area, right. so which will become a courtyard space. Uh, and here's your ball fields. We're not going anywhere near them. Uh, this is the existing basketball courts, mm -hmm. which hopefully will stay untouched. Uh, and then we're creating a circulation road for security around the back of it so that the police and fire department have access to it. Uh, and none of that encroaches to a point where you think it's a problem to the ball fields or to that paved area where the kids play? No? No, to the floodplain either. No, to the okay. floodplain. We're, we're well within the floodplain. You are? Yes. Okay. Flood flood essentially, line. it's the same location, just those portables. Think about it. Slightly further out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
Hope, since the site plan is up here and site plans are I noted this last time something that are very it's something that is very important to me and I'm looking at what there was and can you talk more a little bit about the separation of um, car and bus traffic and just walk me through that a little bit more I'm always interested in currently, how kids are getting out yep, and in yep, school safely and drop-off driveway that comes this way it's the uh, famous uh, stop kiss and go sign so uh, and what we discovered during this blizzard when the snow removal was so heavy this came from the school staff the lot in the driveway here never got plowed so they were able to find a way to phase the buses with the parents utilizing the front so there's no conflict. So they're very comfortable with us removing this because this is a hazard when the parents are driving out through this link and the walkers are crossing it. They were very unhappy with that as a, as a, as a way of dropping the students off from the parents. So this front area where the buses and the driveway is is going to be a shared drop off area. So the buses and the car, cars are actually going? Not simultaneously. They're, they're going to be phased. The way the buses arrive and the way the parents and the cars come, they worked out a way to be to utilize that space safely and comfortably. And that's what's happening today? Is that what you're saying to me? I don't know if they're doing it that way parents? because yeah. the snow is yes, removed. Yes, it's happening that way today. Okay. And I, is staff presence, and maybe if I can ask some of those from the school if, I if you wouldn't mind I can answer that the staff are if, 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 you, oh, sure. if you could come up to my place tell everyone who you are too Please. hi yes um, as we oh Maureen Sawyer um, as we just stated as a result of the blizzard there was no way to use our kiss and go drop-off area so we have four or five staff people out there every single morning directing cars and if a bus comes cars are directed one way and the buses go drop off first can you show me where sure if a bus comes if a bus so if a bus comes buses are brought into this bus lane mm -hmm. and and no cars are so cars are stopped about here by staff drop off of like just two or three cars at a time and then the cars are directed that way again by staff if there's no bus in drop off at that time you have all of these are essentially parent cars and with four or five staff people there they're getting the cars out very late and from what um, Mrs. Anziano our principal has found since we have started this um, kids have been actually on time for school so say for example the last bell would ring and we'd still have cars in here and it would still be probably another 10 minutes of getting those cars that were still in here and the last bus had actually rung now that last bus rings essentially the last car is dropping off and we're all out causes a little bit of a back out for parents leaving the, <laughs> the site plan but the kids are getting to school in their classrooms faster this way well, and the staff are happy with it as well i think my also my issue is besides the speed and efficiency is the safety and the separation yep. of the vehicles and, and you know what and it is nicer because now what was happening before is parents were actually parking here and literally cutting their children here. across that way um, now that doesn't happen at all because you can't park there because the staff are literally forcing you to come through and if you want to get out and walk with your child you have to park up here okay so and that's now been communicated to the school it has been communicated through the school and it has been working ever since the blizzard and it's been working quite nicely and I okay. am one of those people who are a walker but drive my child to school every day so I'm in that and I'm experiencing it daily okay. where if people are walking from or biking to school which are they coming in primarily they come in both areas actually both? If they're walking or biking, they walk in this way along this sidewalk here, and then there's um, a place to park their bikes right here, and then they would continue down and walk on this pathway into school. Or if you come from the lakeside uh, uh, side, what, there's a sidewalk here with a crosswalk that comes about over here and here, and you walk along the sidewalk here, and they can go in the building this way. And there's also a bike rack over here. Okay, so in this plan, will that that will be the same in that terms would be of the same yes the in terms of actually so people who use their feet and walk yes yes okay which leads me to a follow-up on 
and I know it's premature, but it's on security because I think you just identified yes. two points of entry for the building. Yes. And I don't know whether that's going to be consistent or inconsistent with what plans the school administration has going forward for elementary schools. I'm sorry, I did misspeak. Since um, the unfortunate incident of December, children are only allowed to enter into this building and um, oh, okay. guests are only allowed to enter in this this door as well. So there's no access down there's by the no pods. There's no access down oh, by the pods you. right okay. now. I, I misspoke no, there. Except for, I'm sorry, the bus people are directed in that way, but they, there's a staff person there. So busers are directed in here okay. with a staff person only. And that's okay. only bus children getting off the bus at okay. drop off okay. are directed in through right. this door with right. a staff person. That's only children right. on the bus. So the any other child, any other child comes in this way. Right. I mean that, and then that's possibly very fine. But uh, yes. But mm -hmm. there's there's potentially some security analysis that might need to be done on that situation. Yes, okay. there is, and I believe there okay. is a um, currently there is a video camera at that door right now as well. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another follow up to that, and I don't know if this is for you or maybe more of a comment to the folks here from. Central Office and Board of Education, the staffing resources that are needed to make that plan work. Obviously, so it's not a it's not a physical layout that allows it to happen on its own. It requires staffing. Absolutely. And um, is that something that we we can commit to, and are committing to? I'm, I'm not really sure who this question is for. Um, but I, I will say, just as a parent, I noticed that many school communities since December, it has been different, obviously, at pick up and drop off in terms of our, how and what our teachers have done right. um, to help teachers and staff. And, and I yes. thank them for that. But I think my question is, when we're looking at a site plan, do we need to look at a plan that doesn't commit staff resources and something that will allow the physical environment to take care of it. Is there, through you, may I ask the, someone from the Board of Education or Central Office if there's someone who can address that? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Thank you. Pamela Icono, Vice Chairman of the Board of Education and also a Riverfield parent, so I'm in that line every morning as well. Um, it is extremely labor intensive, um, but I think given what the economic climate is, um, the staff has been creative in finding a way to make this work in a much safer manner. Um, it's not ideal. I think if we had more money to spend, um, that there would be more of a push to make this the perfect situation where you've got a better traffic circle and you don't have such a big line of cars going out and you don't have to have six to eight people outside you could cut that in half um, however you know we're working really hard to get that number down to 13 million dollars which is what the you know estimation is in the water fill chart and um, in some ways we got lucky on that storm and being able to discover that this is definitely a much safer solution than what we were doing before because our kids are getting out of the car on the sidewalk and nobody's crossing anymore which was really it was scary um, but in terms of is that really the ideal traffic pattern that we want probably not but um, if you're looking at ways to save money and will this work, yes. And whether or not we'll be able to maintain that staffing level is a question for the whole board and you know where our budget ends up and how that ends up being. But um, I can tell you, and I know I speak for on behalf of the staff, that safety is an utmost concern to them. And um, if they're needed out there, they'll be out there. Um, so I, I'm not concerned about their commitment to making that happen. I hope that helps. Yes, yeah, thank, you. thank you. Just a quick final thought on that, and everything you say I agree with completely. Um, my point, big picture, without knowing, because every school is different, every drop off is different, every situation is different. We have t you know, plenty of schools. I, I, I guess what I'm coming back to in my mind is you know, we have an opportunity here with a brand new 
well, with a with an updated school to you know be be a reference school for what we do down the road with our other schools from a security perspective. If there's a way that we can make it safer and smarter and more efficient and better, you know, I, I would hate to be you know penny wise and pound foolish on that particular item at the expense of making it either inconvenient for staff or leaving loopholes in the process or in the building that we could maybe take care of and correct now to make the entire you know drop off pickup process and security process you know as buttoned up as we can so we can make this the model school this is our chance to do it right is what i'm trying to say so i don't know what that means but i think it's an important component for us to consider within the 15 million dollars I just uh, just to echo what Mr. Kiley said, I think that, that security obviously is, is uh, something we're much more aware of today than, than a few months back. And I think that um, I would encourage the building committee to meet with uh, our police department sooner rather than later to make sure that, that whatever recommendations they have are incorporated, be they uh, software in terms of policies and procedures or hardware in terms of things we need to uh, look at changing or adding within the structure. I just. Uh, uh, one of the concerns would be we don't want to get too far down the road and, and uh, being retrofitting something when we're doing this much renovation uh, at the time. This is actually a question. Thank you. Uh, oh, question yeah, comment. Question. No, I'm, thank, thank you. you thank you very much. <laughs> and um, I, I think that I'm talking about security and safety from a broader perspective. Okay. The, the issue that got me involved in politics in the first place was actually getting kids safely to school, um, whether they're in their car or they're on their feet, whatever it is. So I, I also, I respect that sense that the building committee has done everything they can to try and make this project workable and as affordable as possible. And I guess if I may ask um, someone from the building committee or uh, from well, the architect, the well, yeah, yeah you, Mr. Quinn, perhaps you can decide who the best person to address this is, but did you all discuss, now that you have this new configuration, different from the last one, any other options for site plan, or is this the only option that you look at? In terms at? of the parking and uh, the flow of traffic, the parking, traffic. drop off. We had discussed numerous plans before we settled on the one we had. And then, during, as was stated, during the snowstorm, Brenda and her staff came up with this, and this we got into the mix and accepted that one. But we had looked at two or three other, you know, various types of, uh, you know, circular driveways and different types of, uh, you know, unloading zones. Were, were those, were the plans that you looked at, or were the other options you looked at, did they differ in cost and were they actually more Well, basically, expensive? they were the cost issue as much as they were safety. This is the safest one we have. Yeah, I know they were, both, they were both, they were less safe and more costly. Okay. That's what they ended up being. That's, that was the Yeah. On site. Okay. Which is, and yeah. the safety being the more paramount. Right, and that's Good what yeah. Mrs. Appreciate Icona that. was yeah, referring to. I And I recognize the site, site is limited. I also recognize that I'll just take a chance to say, you know, as parents, we all can just be more aware and maybe slow down a little bit as we're trying to get through our days. I, I'm guilty as everyone else. So. That's not part of my charge. No, <laughs> I'm just taking that little public service announcement. Uh, Smart man. What, one other, one last question on the... Uh, Doesn't have just, to be your last. Well, on this piece, <laughs> I won't promise actually on this. That, <laughs> that's an existing parking lot now. I, I don't go down into that one, but is it configured the same way as the the second one that's up there. The first one I know, I drive through that. Side, but I, or this side, which one are you talking? Top this up one. there, yes. It's very similar in configuration. Okay, so it's changing It, it extends further out this way, but the addition is foreshortening our ability to put anything there. So we're, we're enhancing this driveway. This driveway is currently a little tiny one-way entrance yeah, right. uh, because you're expected to exit the other way. So this will be enhanced. It has to be big enough to get truck access because this will become our delivery point into the building for facilities and any other deliveries for the kitchen. So this will be enhanced and, and part of eliminating that drop-off area here allowed us to bring this 
new construction further away from the property line and eliminate a retaining wall uh, and grade it off naturally and still provide evergreen separations from the, for the neighbors. Okay. And that's it's great news also the delivery separation from the yes. student pedestrian. That's great. Thank you. You're and thanks. I, I did want to say that um, the pedestrian, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, lost my thought there for a it's second. Your, your fan base is here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just want to say something before I leave. Can I say something? Uh, that's not not up to me, actually. <laughs> I have a fifth son at a birthday party here for an hour and a half. This is so important. I've got the class of 2022 back here. Um, <laughs> well behaved, I might so add. If you'll come up and so be very, <laughs> I, very time effective. If you thank so you. Kind. I'll be as efficient as possible. My name is Hope Crotty. I have three children at Riverfield and two children coming in the next couple of years. Um, in light of Newtown, I can't tell you how, how sick I feel um, about the condition of Riverfield um, and how I, 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 don't, I lose sleep at night thinking about those portables. They must be attached to the buildings. It feels like they are, those children sit alone out there. There's no communication between the school and those portables. And it's, it's like they're sort of sitting there, you know, waiting for awful things to happen. It's, it makes me quite nervous. Secondly, when I went to visit Riverfield when we bought our home two years ago, I viewed the school, I um, toured the school, and when I walked around the school, I saw, as a, I'm a special education teacher, I saw children in the hallway receiving occupational therapy. Now, to me, if I were that, I would have been horrified to have my child, who already has a disability and is trying to overcome that disability, be subject to public you know, ridicule, if, if, and sometimes that did happen. Um, no privacy for that child. They were right in the hallway for everyone to see them. These big bouncing ball, all the manipulatives were out right in the hallway. And that still goes on today. And those are the two most important um, f things for me as far as safety and um, the special education students. I'm really hoping that you consider, there's a lot of parents here, a lot of parents left because we couldn't stay, but this is crucial to us. I know that the budget was, messed up in some way, but we really need um, the school to be at par. It's, it's sad the way it is. I don't even, have you ever been there? It's very, it's, we're better than that, right? We're, we're better than that. We don't need that. So please help us. We're asking for your help. Please. Thank you. That's thank fine. You. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> thank you. Drive slow. Okay. Yes. Um, Thanks for that. <laughs> see a couple couple things along those lines. We've we bounced on a couple different topics here. Uh, we eliminated kind of revamping the parking area, I think, on the... Uh, we modified it. Did we modify it or not modify it? Was there more <coughs> work being done on that? This, this, area, this area is going to remain as is. Okay. Uh, this area in the dark is being modified, as is this area along here. How much, how much of a cost savings was, was there by not modifying those areas? Uh, I'm going to guess a half a million dollars because oh. one of the separation plans that we had involved taking the green space away in front of the building and getting the bus drop off parallel to the parent drop off for additional parking and it was not well received from a cost perspective as well as having to modify all that existing paving so just because we we're able to do that uh, i guess thankfully to nemo uh, we we're able to save five hundred thousand dollars well, because when you change the paving, you're also changing the drainage yep. and all the other affiliated costs with it. So it, it was a costly item. Okay. I guess that's a guess from memory. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, again, I've gotten several emails. I suspect my colleagues have. Uh, and it, it was just referenced um, uh, in the, the comments a moment ago. Can somebody talk about special ed in the hallways, uh, OT, PT, and uh, the pod still being there, kind of how is this going to work and fit in? Have, have these have these functional issues been addressed with it? Yes, uh, yes. yes. I believe they have. Uh, I believe one of the OT classes well, there's a single OT. is here in the pod, and it's really it was designed as low millwork with wall cabinets, and it's separated by drapes. It's very cramped. It's very crowded. So that will be taken out 
from there and put in a classroom environment on this end of the building. So it will be within a space. This will become a resource room for uh, other teaching pur purposes. So no more OT or PT in the hallways? Right? No. Right. Absolutely not. It's a separate, separate classroom. I saw that too my first trip through. Didn't do much my Irish temper. The um, you Irish? Um, <laughs> I know. This is really a shame. Almost as funny. <laughs> almost as funny as asking if he has I a temper. Right? The um, somebody mentioned PCBs. Obviously a um, topic of concern based on our experience from last year. Can somebody give us an update on? PCBs, what we know, what we don't know, when we test, when we might know more. Um. We did preliminary testing in the areas where our additions were going to go. They tested for PCBs, they tested for asbestos in the floor is that, tiles. Is that, excuse me for interrupting, but is that interior to the current building or is that one on the exterior by the portables? Uh, in the when existing you say test, just in, in, in the existing building. Okay. The portables were looked at and I don't think there was any issues there. And uh, we're carrying approximately $400,000 for uh, abatement and remediation in the areas where it's encountered. There's a detailed report we can pass on to you. There will be additional work done uh, as the process advances. But this is preliminarily identified the areas we need to address. That doesn't certainly understand. That does not do the whole building. Only in the areas that we were going to be touching. And, and Mr. Quinn, that I think was a quote you had said earlier on, or had somebody had said, but I'm going to attribute it to you. Is it you're, good? Because you're here. <laughs> Is it good? Um, when you talk about only testing the areas what we're touching, but with 30,000 feet of new construction, 30,000 feet of renovation, uh, we're touching pretty much everything. Well, we're talking about walls and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so well, perhaps maybe the definition of what is touching me then in terms of. Well, what we're. we're it's 17,000 feet of new construction. But the areas that are being renovated where we have to punch through walls, where we have to remove windows, uh, we don't think there's an issue with the windows because they've been relatively replaced. Uh, the floor tiles, whatever, where our new addition touches the existing building. So uh, where we were demolishing and, and going to be removing the gym, those, wherever we create, we created a demolition plan of what we had to take down to put the addition, those are the areas where our environmental people did their testing. Have you been able to meet with the consultants that are currently hired by the Board of Ed and get just at least a walkthrough tentative assessment of, of where the op potential uh, opportunities for PCBs are in this at all yet? Not for them, but our own consultants are the ones that we are. Okay. They're not the ones that you hire with the other schools. Is, is that process. part of the process? Was that considered, not considered? What's the... What and I have to talk to Sal and, and Tom, but uh, it wasn't part of our process at this juncture. Okay, I'm just... My question is really because of the extensive work that we're doing on this and because I believe the consultants are working on the schools, and I know we don't want it... Testing would be in your time frame at your schedule, I understand that, but any um, opportunity to get a heads up from the folks that kind of help you with your four hundred thousand dollar estimate, whether that would be uh, appropriate given the school, given what they may have learned from other school buildings and other structures yeah. in town. What? Yeah, my question deals more with are we taking advantage of what they've learned about our buildings and the age of the buildings and the materials used, not to get them to come in and replace any of the consultants' work that you're doing, but since they potentially have uh, this body of knowledge over the last almost year now. It's a very good question. Um, Tom Cullen, Director of Operations for Central Office. Uh, unfortunately, it's two different processes. Uh, the process that the committee's working on is actually testing with a laboratory and a consultant. Uh, looking for when you say committee you're referring to this building building committee oh, thank you <clears throat> looking for uh, lead paint asbestos containing materials and PCB the consultants that central office has hired is Woodard and Curran uh, they are not testing because as soon as we test for PCB the results have to go to the Connecticut DEP and the United States EPA um, they've got a process to um, 
to take the knowledge of the history of buildings, construction of buildings, and with a risk manager, um, do some chlorine scanning in the building. What chlorine scanning does is um, there's a lot of chlorine in PCB. They can do a chlorine scanning with a special gun, give you a percentage of an idea of certain materials in the building that may contain PCB. Uh, they're working with us on a history of all the schools since the issue with Osborne Hill and Fairfield High School. So I wouldn't see them working with the building committee or this project team um, to look at what they found with their consultant based on the work they're doing. Um, I see it as apples and oranges. All right, interesting. My, my question is, is given we're going to do at least 15,000 mm -hmm. square feet of heavy renovation, given we're putting in an estimate, and, and I understand it's going to be tested, so I'm not trying to, te and I understand the testing concept, <coughs> you test at the appropriate time, so it, it, um, but given that the other guys aren't testing, <coughs> given they can do the chlorine sweep, and given we're trying to get a handle on the $400,000, whether that's enough or not, because we don't want to walk into this and find out it should have been a million five later because of what comes out of this, and uh, given we can't know that 100% for sure until we do the testing, couldn't we do the indicators and, and find out, and wouldn't that be they quicker actually, and easier? I believe they have done Riverfield. Woodard and Kern has done Riverfield. It's just the timing hasn't been sequential okay. to share with. Okay. Somebody, committee. could somebody describe that or fill us in, or, or when's the building committee going to get let in on what they found? When we get the final report, uh, what are you don't uh, don't get hurt. We don't need any ocean. <laughs> I don't know if broke your, your podium. Uh, the water incurring report obviously would be shared uh, with the building committee, so they can glean whatever information they have for the Riverfield facility. So the time frame of where they're coming from for their estimate from their professional that they had on board is what they needed. That was his professional estimate what they needed to move forward with the conceptual budget and uh, and so forth. Um, not wanting to do the testing before financing is in place is just a, if you did it you you could you know end up with the problem that they're not funded for so it, it's the proper timing for them to use their consultant they their consultant can obviously look at the water and current report when it's uh, distributed when they're getting ready to do their final testing of elements right. when will the, when <coughs> will the report be available at the end of this month very close. They and got very set close. back Can't with a lot of the bad weather. Any any chance? Have they? But you said they've already done Riverfield. Right. They've done, they've taken their screening and samples of yeah. all okay. the buildings. Okay. So I understand we're not going to test, but we've got some folks that have walked through the school, checked out for PCBs, are putting it in a report. Have already done that. Can't these guys talk? Can't they just get on the phone and say, "Hey, here's what here's what we found when we did our thing," and and let the building committee know? So if this number isn't good. First of all, if the number is good, validate that, hey, that's a reasonable guess. We know we won't know until we test, but that's a reasonable guess, estimate, or opinion of it. If not, say, hold it, what we found indicates it might be twice as much, three times as much as that. Okay. Uh, you guys better either do some more thorough testing or be cautious on that number uh, as mm -hmm. part of that. Because to your point, maybe for the conceptual point, that was all that was needed, but we've got a resolution in front of us for $15 million that, um, Need, you know, if we have that kind of support, the, the PCBs, and again, to some degree, yes, I'm very cautious just because of what we went through in Osborne Hill, and I know Riverfield is an Osborne Hill, so I don't mean to equate the two in, in that fashion. But it just seems we have more information that ought to be shared with the consultants in the building committee than, uh, than well, rather than waiting for the report on the whole system. It's like, here's the draft, here's the pages, here's the two pages that deal with Riverfield, here's what we found, please use this information to help build the budget structure. And hopefully it just validates what's there. I'm not. I'm not yeah, I, I don't know that the can. That we don't not even have a draft report to look at, so I don't know if it's as simple as you're saying. Pull out two pages and might be intertwined in a analysis across the whole district. But yeah. which I, is, I'll be happy which to is ask why, that. if they talk, it, they I'll ought be to be able to, to ask for information. Quicker. I'm not talking about tearing two pages out, but if somebody has the information, that information ought to be shared with the building committee so mm -hmm. we can get to that number sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. All right, thank, thank you for coming up and didn't mean to, thank you for clarifying. Kind of no no problem. Uh,
And then, if it's okay, please. A couple, couple cost questions. Um, I'm just trying to tie back to some of the numbers. And what I heard earlier was that we saved approximately $500,000 due to timing because we compressed the schedule, because we don't have to go later, we can get this started in June of 2014. And then I heard that we saved about $500,000 due to the uh, not having to revamp the parking, kind of the, the Nemo adjustment, for lack of a better term, because that's what we learned from there. Right. And then I'm seeing that the expansion of the AC system saved us maybe $600,000. And then I'm seeing we didn't have to enlarge the gym, and that saved us another four hundred thousand uh, dollars. That's like two million. Can somebody fill me in on why we didn't get further down from fifteen million to thirteen million? Not thirteen nine, but actually thirteen million. Because we seem to have identified. I, I, can, I can start. You can add some comments. If you could do that from the mic, so that sure. Yeah. So um, there were our initial estimate was done without the uh, benefit of having a construction manager on board. We've been asking for the town to, to retain a construction manager because they're going to have different views of how they're going to do the project. So there are a variety of things in our estimate, initial estimate of $15 million that wasn't in this estimate. The way the contractor is going to phase the project, the way he's going to lay down, what he's got to do to the fields, and um, uh, there were certain things that got added back in that were in the original one, the second line of the kitchen taking the stage out. So there were things that went down, there were things that went up, and the larger area was the mechanical, and as we got further down into knowing more and more about the mechanical the, uh, and c comparing with the other estimator, those numbers of mechanical and electrical went up. And that's where, uh, from our original 15 million. So if you're uh, <coughs> looking and comparing all that, they arm wrestled, they went through every single line item. We had the benefit of a second estimator, and that's <laughs> where it came out. Okay, so potentially we went, we took out $2 million worth of components or functions, uh, but then put back in a million and higher costs on the remaining $13 million. Yeah. I mean, it, that, I think that's. A, there's a number of things that we kill pay and join at the group. They put in a construction contingency <clears throat> that we didn't have, have a half a million dollars. They put in uh, general conditions for 100. I, I thought we were told the construction contingency moved yeah, from the Tom, we did have owner's the line method. up to the we other one. That was apples to apples. Okay. So the, the, the construction contingency didn't change, is that correct? It just went from just below the, the line to within the construction number. Yeah, the phasing cost that they came up with mm -hmm. was $400,000. It wasn't uh, when you say, I thought, help me out with that because I, I thought I heard that we'd save five hundred thousand dollars by changing the timing. When you talk about phasing, phasing, phasing. I just whoever answers is fine, but from the mic, if you'd be so kind. Yes. The, the phasing concept we're talking about is how the site is utilized and what is disturbed and what has to be restored. So I mean, you're looking at a finished plan. Uh, Gil Bain put together a phasing plan that's going to utilize the back of this property for lay down area for construction. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a substantial amount of disturbance. The topsoil will be removed, stockpiled, stone put down, and it has to be put back. Traffic control, interior functions of separating the school students from the construction sites while the work is ongoing, uh, a safety plan. Those are the uh, detailed numbers that they came up with that we had to put back into the estimate, which push the number up again. Okay. First off the top, I want to thank you for doing that. When, when Tomlinson was done, all the uh, heavy duty equipment was parked on the football field, totally destroyed one of the most beautiful football fields in the county. The fact that I played on it had nothing to do with that. Um, and we had to go back and do a lot of rework to make that available and that was not included as part of that project. So when the project was over, that field was left in just horrible shape. Correct. So right off the top, so that, thank right you off, for yeah. thinking that far ahead <laughs> and considering and that. that. That wasn't in our, we didn't understand that because we're not construction managers. <clears throat> we didn't understand the complexity of that. It wasn't in our estimates. So no. That back up. no, it's, go ahead. To follow up on phasing, I remember a conversation about phasing and the design that you had previously, would that allow for simpler phasing or 
in other words, the change in design also helped with the escalate. It's actually simplified phase. Okay. Uh, uh, and one of the okay. reasons is because the, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, this simplified the phasing. Um, okay. One of the reasons is the addition is smaller. But uh, Gilbane again went through it. Maybe SBS can go give more detail about that. And they found that this was this scheme was actually favorable to the other scheme. Okay. And again, the other scheme was based on larger square footages. And so at the time, we that's what we thought. Can I, can I go back to Mr. Tetro's uh, questions about the $2 million? And I, I understand the concepts. Things are going down. Things are going up. Can you also, Britt, can you build a bridge analysis from the prior project to this project so we can see what went up, what went down, and what the net effects of it yes. are? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then if I could, on the um, second line in the kitchen, in the cafeteria, understand that the idea is to, to make sure the kids get food to eat. I haven't had a chance to have lunch at Riverfield. I did have a chance to have lunch a couple of different times at Sherman, so I've experienced the one-line uh, uh, log jam that can take place on that. It was also my understanding, somebody pointed out that um, the issue had more to do with having one cash register versus two cash registers than two full serving lines. Uh, did somebody evaluate that and would just having a second ca cash register uh, suffice or and, uh, and what's the and what was the increased cost of the second serving line? <coughs> We, we had some discussions about the one register, two register discussion, and the bottom line is even if you had two registers, the kids tend to back up in the serving line when they can't make up their minds what they want. Uh, so it's not just an issue of having two registers, it's having the ability to move kids through two lines at the same time. Initially, when we did the entire renovation of the kitchen, we had programmed in about a half a million dollars to renovate it. Under this concept, we're going to do additions to the kitchen. We're going to reuse the equipment that's good, and I believe our budget line item is about two hundred thousand dollars, two hundred forty thousand uh, dollars, because we still have to move kitchen, move equipment around, uh, repipe it to, to make accommodation for the new serving line. So, compared to the, the proposal we saw last time, that's an incremental two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's that's gone up. <laughs> As part of our cost saving approach the first time house will leave the kitchen alone. Okay. Um, go right ahead. This is for the Board of Education and um, this is icon on Mr. Dwyer. I know that as the Riverfield person, I the serving line question is one that's of interest to me. Um, Stratfield, which went through a massive renovation, I also have familiarity with that school as a parent um, and they were not that was not one of the things that they were able to accomplish at the school when they did it um, and that school is now you know I think projected next year to have our largest population it's not always ideal and I certainly recognize that as a parent I I'm wondering my question specifically is has that what Mr. Tetra is talking about having the, its computers um, has it been tested anywhere to use the two computers in a line to see if that does mitigate? Or in other words, I, if you can help us just understand kind of the history of that conversation with the two serving lines, it would be great. Um, have we done scientific research and produced data? No. Um, but when we were looking at the whole Sherman project, um, uh, the Sherman Committee, along with some members of central office staff, went to um, Osborne Hill, which has the two lines, and to McKinley. And um, we timed everything out. And the more efficient way and the fastest way to get the food to the children so that they can eat um, is by having the two lines. McKinley only has the one long line. Um, but it is definitely much faster and much more efficient to get the food to the children in a two-line scenario. Um, you have to remember we're dealing with kindergarten through fifth grade, so you're dealing with five through ten, maybe eleven-year-olds. And these are the kids that get up there and even though they ordered chicken parmesan, but then they get there and they want a bagel and they stand there 
and they look at the chocolate milk and then they go back and then they're like, well, no, I changed my mind. I want regular milk. Um, so it really holds the whole thing up. Um, and adding a cash register, and I have no data to back that up, would probably help them pay faster, but it won't necessarily get them out of that line faster. Um, if you go to Osborne Hill, you'll see them walk right to the counter, get their food, walk back and sit right down. And they only have 20 minutes for lunch. So literally every minute they have counts in terms of eating. Um, again, I know you're looking at cost saving measures. Is it an ideal situation to have the one line? No. Truthfully, can I answer you, does it work? Yes, but um, I think this is money well spent personally. Um, it's a healthy habit that we need to develop and not encourage people to scarf down their food, but um, I understand you're faced with difficult decisions on what you want to bond and where you want to go with it. Well, and actually, my, I think you answered my question somewhat. At McKinley, there's, is there one computer at the end of the line, or do they have multiple computers at the end of the line? There's only one. Because you're, what yeah. I'm asking is, if there were two, part of my question is, I'll give you the whole thing. When my daughter, who's now a freshman, was in kindergarten, the milk, there were tickets. It was the old-fashioned way. Yeah. So they didn't have to wait if they were getting milk in the same line. They were only getting milk and had brought their lunch from home. Now we have a computerized system that brings up every student's photo, yeah. and, and it's entered that way. So all the students go through the line, at least at Stratfield. I can only speak to that. So that's just a, a question that I have is if you had and I don't know if staffing works, but it, does McKinley have two terminals or? If, I mean, if you're going to speak, you need to come up to the podium. Because that's what I'm asking. Right. It's, it's McKinley does not have two terminals. It just they has only a have long one. They just have I one long lunch line. Lunch yep. And then they have the paraprofessionals, like they do at all the other schools, right. helping the kids get through the line. Right. And like you said, I'm going to go on the assumption that two is better than one. If you have two right. people checking people out, that would help. Um, but I can only tell you what we witnessed, which right. was a much faster system. It wasn't the paying, it was getting the physical food. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what you wanted to add. It, I, I think when we're if talking- If you could be kind enough to identify yourself, My please. name is Sue Brand, I'm a member of the Board of Education. Um, my children have long since left the district, they're much older at this point, but the same kind of issues that I saw years ago are the same ones that we're dealing with now. Many of the buildings have a number of portables. We've added a lot of volume that the buildings were not designed for. What we're seeing in the recommendations here are to try and accommodate that increased volume. Part of that is the design of the cafeteria because it cannot accommodate the volume efficiently as it did before. It would be nice if it were just a computer that could do that. I think that would, if that were the case, that would have been long, done long ago because this has been going on for quite some time. But because of the volume, they try and cycle the kids through very quickly. They tell the kids not to talk. They want them to eat. It's a very tight cycle that we put the children through. So to your point with computers helping, not enough. It's, it's a design issue, which is why you see the recommendation. Yeah, it's just a point that I'd heard from uh, somewhere. At my, to, to the best of your knowledge, has anybody ever tested it with adding another computer to see what, would, uh, what the impact Did you, would be? I think there was an instance, wasn't there? Thank you. And I, I think where it stemmed from, because when we originally were looking at this from the building committee perspective, and we were thinking that it was going to be too expensive to say it, to say it, one of the things that Mr. Quinn wanted to explore was the issue of the cash registers. And I kept saying to him, would you please go and look and see what the difference is at Osborne Hill and McKinley, or even now Sherman and McKinley, and you'll see you can see physically how different it is. Um, and again, I can only stress that it's literally when you're five and you have 20 minutes, you need every minute of it. And obviously a lot of choices. Yes. <laughs> I can answer your question. When Osborne Hill first opened. Mr. Cullen, if I could perhaps closer to the mic. I sure. think that helps. When Osborne Hill first opened with the two serving lines, the kitchen manager thought he could do it with one computer. And he tried it the first week tried to control two lines coming at him and just doing it as quick as he could and he could keep up. So we had to add the second computer and it did make a huge difference. 
I, I think the question was slightly different. Right. Have, did, we ever did, have we ever had two one line right, with, two, with computers. two computers to see if that's the bottleneck and how much that speed? We ever had two computers. Doesn't. I think if we could get the food director here, you'd yeah. find out that um, uh, the one line, uh, it's not broken up equal. The children don't come in and 50% of them get hot lunch and 50% get cold lunch, and it works so nicely. They can come from two different directions, get things from the cold cooler, and the other 50% get them from the hot cooler. As we have experienced, expressed here, the children come in and a lot of them, uh, because it's pizza day, they're all getting hot lunch and there's a ton of them, or it's a cold day, or they get up there and they decide, well, I don't want the cold lunch today. I'm going to decide on the hot and change my mind. And, you just don't know. So when you do the two serving lines, you try and appease the multitude of kids and what they want, hot or cold, what they're pulling it from, hot or cold stations. No, that makes sense. But the okay. simple answer is no, we haven't tested it. No. Uh, cases. We have that. All right, thank you. But. Yeah. Um, I, thank you, Paul. Oh, I, I just want to be clear. I happen to have children in those large bubble years. I you know, fit the profile. So I have kids in classes who have dealt with the issue and I'm very sensitive to it just from a health standpoint and understanding that yes we want our kids to eat in a healthy environment and that it does really compress the time so I I do just wanted to say I, I do understand that but I, I think thank you for answering my questions about it because you know as, as Mrs. Iacono pointed out with respect to the site plan and everything you know at, at this point we're we're looking at everything or I am. I won't speak for my uh, fellow board members, but thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll review this from it. Anybody have any other questions? No, I'm good. Uh, okay. Uh, since board's kind of done, uh, any comments from the public? And I just ask you one at a time, please come up to the podium. And please just uh, give us your name and address if you'd be so kind. Hi, my name is Amy Crawford. Um, I'm a Riverfield parent of both a first and fourth grader. I'm asking for your continued support of our building initiative. I am aware the proposed budget has exceeded initial, expect, uh, an, uh, initial esti uh, estimates, but I believe our town committee has been fair, reasonable, forthcoming, obviously hardworking, and yes, uh, reasonable with respect to cost. I realize this sounds odd attached to a $15 million price tag, but our Riverfield reality is that our 50 plus year old school physically is not meeting even the basic of standards. I know most of you, if not all, have toured our school and even with the briefest school tour, evidences our deficiencies. We have not one common space that can adequately accommodate all children. We have cafeteria equipment in our corridors. PT, OT, and various other special services such as speech and reading assistance are administered in hallways, doorways, and closets. Our cafeteria is too small even for the current number of students, and even our school nurse's office and bathroom are inaccessible to any child in a wheelchair. <clears throat> our parking is beyond inadequate with our predominantly non-busing population. Um, and please do visit our school between the hours of 325 and 345, and I hope I don't come across as being too severe, but it really is a miracle that something tragic hasn't happened to date. We are pushed out to two parking lots with the entire population leaving two parking lots. That's where we leave. Um, and I haven't even spoken about the security issues surrounding the unattached classrooms. The educational specifications approval was an arduous task last year, but one that was approved by all of our town bodies, and I believe they were approved because it was clearly evidenced that these specifications were needs, and that we have an obligation as a community um, and to these children to deliver. Um, I know some of the, the specifics of the project are under uh, financial scrutiny, let's say air conditioning. <clears throat> and I know the proposal has eliminated it, but if you speak to administrators, teachers, students, and parents, all will tell you that heat impacts learning. It impacts children's health. And while 23 to 25 students in a classroom, no larger than this one, and so if we took a few people out um, on a May or June day or August, 
Um, most of our, also most of our classrooms have the pleasure of having either 50% full morning sun or 50% full morning afternoon sun for additional heating pleasure. And if I may be so bold, um, I'm not sure other town agencies would see air conditioning as a want, but more of, as, as a, of a need. Um, for us, new windows have prevented even the mildest of airflow. They open out and not out. Um, and the increased necessary security measures have limited the ability to open doors for circulation. So all viable options to cool a classroom down are gone. I know this is a highly debated topic, but one I referenced to showcase not one line item in the building plan has been included, included with a frivolous nature. <clears throat> Others may ask for the project to be modified to fit an original forecasted amount to cut to the right number Last year, we heard from the other RTM that other building initiatives had been penny-wise and pound-foolish. Um, for example, I think skids were left off of stairs that had to then um, be reapplied at a higher uh, cost. To cut today, to need to spend tomorrow, seems like a counterintuitive process and still does not solve for our need. <clears throat> In conclusion, may I ask you to remember and reconsider our school, our children, we have waited for other projects to go first, just as worthy as ours, and now it is our time. Please remember that our parents, our building committee, many of whom are not Riverfield related, are also taxpayers, that we do not want to increase taxes by spending too much. We too want to be fiscally responsible, don't want to spend more than is needed. It is simply that needed. Thank you for your time. Any other comments from the public? Hello, Sue Brand again, Board of Education. I am going to speak clearly about how my own personal perspective, not obviously that of the board because I can't do that, but I can tell you as a board member when this project came before us and I was looking at it, I knew that I had visited all the schools in the district and I knew bar none this one needed work. So I know as a board member it's not within our purview to tell you what how you should price it out. But I can tell you in all sincerity that this project does need to be done. Thank you. Any further public comment? I'm here to comment on... If you'd be good enough just to state your name and address, please. Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Seth Furmender, and I live at 17 Robert, which is uh, in the Riverfield school community. Um, my wife Liz and our three boys moved to the Riverfield neighborhood from Colorado in January of this year. We chose to move to the Riverfield neighborhood for many reasons. The primary reason being we met, we met with the leadership of the Riverfield school prior to purchasing our home and were extremely impressed by the individuals we met. We had looked in other towns around the state and had met with other principals and teachers and had toured many schools. In the end, we were most impressed with the leadership and staff at Riverfield and we therefore purchased a house in the neighborhood and enrolled our children at the Riverfield School. Thus far, our experience has confirmed our initial thoughts about the quality of leadership and the staff at Riverfield. This is blue ribbon leadership and a blue ribbon staff. Our experience with the children and their parents has been a very positive one also. The Riverfield community is a great and welcoming community. Prior to moving to Colorado, I had attended high school in Fairfield in the 1990s. And upon my return to Connecticut recently, I quickly noticed the upgrades to many of the schools in Fairfield that had taken place since my departure about 20 years ago. Interestingly, and quite frankly a bit baffling, is that the Riverfield School has not received the financial support that many of the other schools in the town of Fairfield have apparently received. The upgrades at Riverfield um, are, are safety focused upgrades that will enhance the learning environment and the community as a whole. These are also upgrades 
that will simply update facilities, um, bringing them current in the same way that other school facilities around Fairfield have been brought current. The greatest thing that will result from the upgrades is that the school facilities will be brought up to the same high level of the people who work at the school and those who attend the school and those who have enrolled their children at the school. With this said, the time is now for the first selectman to work with the Riverfield Building Committee in a collaborative fashion to reach an agreement about how best to upgrade the Riverfield Schools facilities and then to see that the upgrades are made. Each and every member of the Riverfield School community will benefit from the upgrades, even those who do not have children who attend the school. This is true because the presence of an upgraded school in our community will drive real estate prices higher and will spurn construction-related enhancements to the real estate. We witnessed this phenomenon in Colorado because we lived in a community that was built on Denver's first major airport, the Stapledon Airport. The great community of Stapledon was built around great schools. And the schools drove the real estate values in the community and the prestige in the community also, both of which were very high. Great schools, great principals, great teachers, and great students provide the backbone of a community. And it is time to provide these people what they deserve, upgraded facilities at Riverfield School. For my part, I'm a 12-year construction lawyer who will provide pro bono legal services during all phases of the project, design, construction, and closeout, in an effort to keep the legal costs low, which, which are, we all know, will will likely be high. I can be reached at 303-669-0450. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the offer. Um, Our fees and expenses just went down. <laughs> Any other Reason. public reason? <laughs> <laughs> um, Kristen Therrington, 79 Walvin Court. And I apologize in advance for duplicating any points uh, that were so eloquently made prior to my speaking. Um, my name is Kristen Therrington. I currently have two children attending Riverfield and one who will be attending in a few years. Like many families in town, my husband and I moved to Fairfield in large part due to the reputation of the public schools. When we commenced our kindergarten registration process a few years ago, we were quite frankly surprised at the physical condition of Riverfield School. We were startled when more than one of the parents we met who had grown up in Fairfield remarked, it's exactly the same as when I went here. If you spend time at Riverfield, you will come to know that we have an amazing community with stellar administrators and teachers and wonderful involved families. However, the physical limitations of the building are glaringly apparent. Portable classrooms are not attached to the main building, posing significant security risks. The indoor air quality does not adequately provide an optimal learning environment. Common areas are not sufficiently large enough to accommodate whole school programs, and as has been said, special ed programs do not have private dedicated space. I'd like to spend a few moments discussing the indoor air quality. As noted, a healthy classroom environment is paramount to our children's overall well-being and fresh air and stable room temperatures at the, are at the core of any environment. I think we can all agree that a lack of appropriate indoor air quality significantly impacts the learning of our students as it would impact our own productivity at work. And if you don't believe me, you can set up shop at Riverfield in maybe one of our kindergarten or first grade classrooms for the month of June, and I can assure you, you will understand what we're talking about. Um, the majority of classrooms in our building are not currently climate controlled and you know we're now encountering a new normal where school commences the end of August and runs through the end of June. I've personally been in classrooms, reading, volunteering where the temperature has exceeded 90 degrees. 
Given the changing safety climate, it's no longer acceptable for, for teachers to prop open doors, thus compromising their own and their children's safety. Additionally, rotating children through air-conditioned portions of the school, such as the gym and the library, take away from instructional time, and it's no longer a viable option. Moreover, I really feel that the lack of fresh air and excessive heat is detrimental to the safety and the health of the children, especially those with allergies and asthma. And if you've experienced seasonal allergies, you know yourself how detrimental this can be. The combination of poor air quality and heat can cause various ailments ranging from headaches, nausea, heat exhaustion, asthma attacks. Dehydration can cause the seizure, the seizure threshold in children who are prone to neurological events to be lowered. Parents have been known, myself one of them, to keep their children home on days where they feel their health is compromised. And that's not an acceptable, that, that's just not acceptable. I've attended various meetings of the Riverfield Building Committee and I'm confident that members have taken their charge seriously and represent all citizens of this community. They have drafted a transparent and detailed proposal based on necessity, not luxury. As a parent, I ask you to please support the Riverfield Project. Our facility needs to be brought up to current standards so that our children can fully maximize the education that our town prides itself on providing. We should do it once, we should do it correctly so that our school building can be fully functional in the future. Also, as a Fairfield taxpayer and homeowner, I implore you to support this project. We must show current residents and future homeowners that our town is willing to invest in its infrastructure and in our children. A school brought up to current standards will only solidify Fairfield in general and the Riverfield community in particular as a, as a desirable place to live. In closing, I would like to sincerely thank the members of the Riverfield Building Committee for their time and dedication to this project and to thank the three of you for your service to Fairfield. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? <coughs> Uh, Philip Dwyer, Chairman of the Board of Education. Uh, I would also like to encourage you to uh, move this project forward on a couple of points. Uh, the Board of Ed, when they move projects forward, say, what are the needs of a building? And Riverfield as an elementary school uh, is certainly the next most important need. That doesn't mean that it is less or more important than the growing high school population. <laughs> it is just a need in itself. Um, there may be questions that come up uh, during the development process that need to get answered. But if, uh, and, and that's pretty common, uh, but the time frame frequently that happens when you're trying to get approvals through a Board of Ed, then a Board of Selectmen, then a Board of Finance, and then an RTM, time is money. And so it might be that you have an open question or two at this level, and that the building committee, as they meet in the next month or two, will get an answer to that question that will then be able to be provided at the Board of Finance meeting. And maybe the numbers will change to the positive uh, as a result of refining that information. But I think it is important to try and move the project forward so that uh, we don't lose time. And time is valuable and time is money. So I do encourage you to, to move the project forward. Uh, I think I can speak on behalf of the Board of Education and say we consider ourselves one of uh, a team of ourselves and yourselves and the Board of Finance and the RTM. And I think as a team, if we all recognize this is a building that needs help, uh, and then what can we afford to spend on it as a team moving the project forward, we can, I think, come to some resolution to that question. But I, wouldn't, I would encourage you to move the project forward so that uh, we don't lose time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dwyer. Any other public comment? <coughs> Nikki Vanosky, um, 1485 Brookside Drive. Um, I'm respect, respectfully requesting your timely support for the proposed Riverfield Elementary School addition and renovation. I'm encouraged to hear your comments and your questions concerning the security of our school. Um, and I appreciate your ongoing support of our learners. However, our existing school building currently cannot meet the needs of our school community. Areas of the greatest concern are directly related to the health, safety, and the security issues that face our community's students, families, and staff. As a parent of three Riverfield students, the greatest area of concern to me personally is related to the safety of the portable classrooms. Currently, one or more of my children participate in 
the gift of the music, the orchestra classes that are being held in the portable classrooms. Consequently, my children are leaving the security of the school building regularly. While I'm confident in the school personnel that care for my children, I can't escape the realization that the isolation of these rooms pose a realistic security issue. Once in the portables, the teacher is essentially isolated with a class of students. In an emergency, there's no immediate support on site to aid the teacher or the students. Our current security policy dictates that all visitors must be escorted into the building by a staff member. However, in the case of the portable classrooms, any individual can walk directly to the door, which is typically left unlocked. Furthermore, as a parent of a child with a medical issue, it's concerning to me to think of what would happen in a medical emergency in that situation. Over the previous years, I have witnessed children regularly walking unsupervised to and from the school building. My own son was locked out of the building at one point and tells a story of how he went from window to window knocking until he was able to re-enter the security of the building. Clearly a great adventure for him, but really upsetting for me as a parent. In addition to the building will allow for greater security and ultimately a healthier learning environment that the current portable classrooms provide. Additionally, the current facility must be brought up to existing building and health codes as established by our town. The work needs to commence as soon as possible. Um, as a community member, I appreciate your understanding of the importance of keeping our town facilities in good standing long into the future as an asset to our community. And thank you so much for your ongoing attention to the Riverfield Project, um, to your continued dedication to our town and our families. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other pu further public comment? Please come up. Dana Alger, 245 Taunton Road. Good evening. My name is Dana Alger, and I am currently serving as PTA president of Riverfield School. I have twins in the second grade, and I was fortunate to have taught kindergarten there for four years from 2005 to 2009. I'm speaking tonight to request your support for Riverfield's building renovation. I have had the pleasure of teaching in many elementary schools in the area and must say the Riverfield community is outstanding. Although I thoroughly enjoyed my teaching experience, I found that whenever I raised questions regarding items such as additional space needed for children receiving special services, air quality, water leaking from the ceiling into light fixtures, long lunch lines resulting in children finishing lunch in the classroom, you name it, anything that was questioned was answered with, Riverfield will have a renovation at some point and all of this will be repaired. That was seven years ago. Repairs at this school have been pushed to the side year after year in hopes that a renovation would happen and here we are requesting a budget in 2013. I want to state that while working at Riverfield, I found the condition of the school inadequate. The fact that students cannot meet for a whole school program in either the gym or the APR due to lack of adequate space is unacceptable. My former students received services in the middle of the hallway, completely distracted without any privacy at all. Students receiving extra reading or math support were frequently taught in closets and hallways due to lack of space. The sinks in the classrooms leaked and caused mold in the cabinets, and the ceilings were peeling from water damage. That occurred when I taught there and is still occurring now. Lastly, the air quality was and still is unhealthy. Now that school is pushed almost until July and starts back at the end of August, our children and teachers are stuffed in overheated classrooms. We had teachers track temperatures last spring and this fall, and many days the temperatures reached 90 degrees or more in the classroom. Gone are the days when we can simply prop the back door open for additional vent and ventilation on hot days. Our world has changed, and safety procedures are taken very seriously. I can recall days when I would actually disrupt my class from learning to take them to the library or to other classrooms in the wings while they had specials just to give them air conditioning and comfort while learning. Air quality affects learning in a healthy learning environment. I know air conditioning sounds like a luxury item, but it isn't in this new age of childhood with asthma and allergies. And when you have over 23 bodies in a classroom with desks and furniture and books and all the materials that go along with it, those little ones are lethargic at the end of the day from the lack of air, and it is unacceptable. We live in Fairfield, Connecticut. This 50-year-old school requires a renovation that will keep up with increasing enrollment in the future. I'm asking for your support for Riverfield's building project. I thank our building committee for all of their hard work to help that bring this project to fruition. And please think of our children and staff who deserve a safe and healthy learning environment. Thank you. Any further public comment? I forgot one part, sorry. Um, 
I just wanted to mention in looking at the new drawings um, that it's striking to me as a parent and as a former teacher that we're looking at air conditioning every part of our building except for where our teachers are teaching and where our students are learning. So I just ask you as, you know, I understand the weighty issues around the budget, but the message that we're sending to our teachers, to our staff, and to our students and families about where we put our, our priorities. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Fiedler and I live at 224 Taunton Road. Um, I have two children that currently attend Riverfield and I have one that's going to go there in a year and a half. Um, I'm here today to ask you to please approve the proposed budget for the renovation at our school. Um, when my son was in first grade, he received uh, special reading services and like they mentioned, he was taught seriously in a closet. So when you have focus issues like he has, the, the services that he was receiving, why I greatly appreciated them, it, they weren't beneficial. I mean, he was looking, it wasn't even a clean closet. They were, you know, games in the, in the, in the, on the shelves and it was just very cluttered and not a good learning environment for him or for anybody. Um, as mentioned before, the portables, they're a big concern. My son plays in the orchestra. Um, it's a big, huge safety concern. Even before Sandy Hook, if you lock the door, it isn't safe because the classes, because the portables aren't connected to the school. And there's no comparing brick and steel to a portable building. And can I also just touch upon in in the kitchen, in the cafeteria, no one mentioned the size of the line. The lunch line is like, literally, it's like this big. It's probably four feet. That's probably the bottleneck. I don't think adding another register is the key. It's just, it, it only probably facilitates three bodies in there, maybe four. So that's a little bit. And also, can I just tell you, the windows, <laughs> They're this big. I mean, they're tall, but what opens, they're that big. So thank you so much. And I really hope that you have heard us and approve this budget. Thank you. Any further public comment? Tom Quinn. I'm a taxpayer as well as chairman of the Riverfield uh, School Building Committee. When I first went to Riverfield, I was stunned that this school was in Fairfield, Connecticut. I was literally stunned. And one of the reasons that I agreed to serve on this committee is because I think we need a change. Um, I still believe we need change. We made a lot of compromises along the way to get to where we're at. But I'll tell you something very candidly. The $15.1 million that we propose for this bond resolution is the right solution for Riverfield. It should be passed. It should go to the Board of Finance. And the devil may care, let's go and fight the battle with them if we have to. But this is the right budget for the right school at the right time. And uh, I say that not only as committee chairman, but as a taxpayer in this city. And uh, I thank you for your support, but only if you pass it. <laughs> <laughs> it's conditional. <laughs> um, Pam Iacono, and I just really <clears throat> wanted to speak as a parent. Um, and the and one of the reasons you're stuck with me on the Board of Education currently is because seven years ago um, I was asked to be the redistricting chair for Riverfield in their PTA um, and naively said yes, <laughs> not really understanding what I was getting myself into as the parent of a first grader at the time and really started to learn about all the different space issues and what we were faced with and some of the stuff that was going on at Riverfield. Um, that and the um, 
sidewalk issue got me involved in, in the school board and here I am now. Um, so I just want to remind you that this started so long ago um, with um, the Riverfield PTA inviting town officials to come and tour our building and to see the state um, in which our children were learning. And it was really, I think you would all agree, subpar for what Fairfield can do. Um, and um, the late, great Ralph Boley, who was a big mentor to me, um, looked at me in the hallway where we did OTPT on a rope in the front of two double doors for anybody to see children that had special needs um, that created fire code issues in the event of an emergency where a child could literally be st strapped in a chair um, and if the fire alarm went off the fire marshal was constantly reminding us that something needed to be done so that this wouldn't block an egress. He looked at me and he said, what, what do you need? And I said, this building needs to be updated and we, need, we desperately need more space. And that was in 2006. And it's now 2013. And it'll be 2014 before this even gets off the ground. So I just want to remind you of the longevity um, and how long this has been waiting in the wings and we waited patiently as we knew that there are other schools ahead of us that needed to get done. Um, but as difficult as it is in this economic climate, um, we want it, we need it. Uh, and as a homeowner in the area um, and with everything that's going on in the real estate market, I am very concerned um, about the value of my home and being in an overcrowded school um, and in a place where it might be more desirable for somebody to move to a different neighborhood versus my house um, because of what's going on at the elementary school right down the street from me. So um, I appreciate your consideration and I really urge you to move forward with this project. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your service on the Board of Ed. No matter how you got roped into it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other public comment? All right, seeing none, back to the board. If I might, just one question. A, a couple of folks have mentioned school capacity. Can somebody uh, just remind us uh, what the current capacity of Riverfield is and when the renovation's done, what the capacity will be? It's 399 right now, it'll be 504. Is the, the, bricks, the bricks and mortar? Bricks and mortar's 399. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it's over 400 right now. With the portables, yeah. it's 400. Yeah, it's bricks and mortar. Bricks and mortar's yeah, it's 440, I believe, right now. Yeah. <coughs> Go ahead. Sure. Actually, uh, have a few follow-up questions based on some of the comments and some people got <coughs> my memory. Um, first, Mrs. Iacono, I actually was there that day with yes. Selectman Boley at the time, and that's actually where I met Mrs. Iacono in that lobby. And one of the questions I have and thank you for your comments related to the OTPT. Is that still happening at the school in front of the doors there? Yes. So that's still the, the, the place the, where? Under Brenda, uh, it's been more limited, okay? And uh, they've done a much better job. But there's a space issue. Right. They do what they try to do. That's why we're here. But at least they're sensitive to this situation. Okay, thank you. I. Right, had similar concerns. So one of the things that I heard someone say that um, air quality is unhealthy, and what I recognize the reality of our kids are gonna be in school basically until July this year, um, and the whole air conditioning conversation, but when I hear someone say air quality is unhealthy in the school today, I just wanna check in with Mr. Cullen and anyone with the tools for schools in the building now are, are we aware of any current specific issues? I understand and I appreciate the general comments that people made about that because it's it's a valid comment. But specifically in terms of, do we have any you know significant concerns, issues that we're addressing right now in terms of air quality issues at the school that are actionable items that you're taking action on? Other than this project, in other words, immediate types of concerns. 
none that come to mind or are work order type process, but generally the building is an old building. Uh, it doesn't have mechanical means of fresh air. Uh, back then, um, buildings were designed for teachers to open windows to get any air, whereas today the code is very different. You're required to have 15 CFM cubic feet per minute of air per student per classroom. It's required, mechanical means, so you're constantly bringing in fresh air and exhausting it. Right now the school just has exhaust and it exhausts air out. If all the windows and doors are shut, it's pulling air from corridors and cracks, cracks around windows and doors. So that generally makes the rooms, you know, stuffy. When you get a classroom with 25 children in it, a teacher, and she shuts the door and they're really working, uh, carbon dioxide levels can go up and it gets uncomfortable. Are you just going to build on that for you? Uh, is that our plan does include a new ventilation system, okay, which will take care of the issues with the current system that you in, in the school. Beyond air conditioning, okay, we're talking about fresh air ventilation system, okay, that uh, will be put into the renovation project. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a couple more. Um, one of the items that was brought up was communication from the portables. Again, I'll reference my experience as a strap village parent, which was in a different era. Um, we had the portables and I, again, invalid comments, but one of my questions, again, I don't know if there's someone who's, uh, someone, a school personnel from the building, the means of communication from the portables. A medical emergency was referenced and I just want to confirm that there is some kind of means of communication from the portables into the main building. I'm sure there is. So yes, there is. You're, Mr. Morbido, you're nodding your head. Okay. Could you just, <coughs> if you could, please. Good point. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the same intercom system that is in the main building is also tied into the portables so that they can have room to room, room to main office, room to nurse communication. They also are capable of dialing 911 and getting to the emergency call center to call the police or fire. Thank you for clarifying that. Again, valid issues in terms of the portable placement and but just want to make sure that we do have that. Um, one of the comments I actually forgot to ask about this so I appreciate the comments about the, the air conditioning and the location of the air conditioning in kind of the office suite versus classrooms. Now, obviously the office suite is a smaller space as I was thinking about that. Um, what was the conversation, you know, and I see the chair is who, the vice chair of the building committee through you to whoever you think. You know. The office suite houses the nurses. Well, office. if you could, oh, from the mic, from the podium. Not a short comment. <laughs> no such luck. Short but important, so I appreciate it. Always, that. always. So. Christine Messina, 54 Drum Road. The office suite houses the nurse's office, and it presently is air conditioned. So we wouldn't be taking something out to put in something new. It's air conditioning that's already existing. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. All right. Those are the end of my questions. Mr. Kiley, did you have any further comments? Um, or questions? Uh, yeah, I've got a few. Um, just, to, just to quickly re reiterate this project. You know needs to get done this building is beyond its useful life um, we've discussed its faults its issues the space today's requirements it should have been fixed 10 years ago that's all true and i agree 100 percent with all of that um mr quinn who's left the room i wish he was here um when he spoke he talked about compromise and he talked about some of the compromises that have been made or that are being made in this plan to get to where we are today. And I want to talk about that because I do feel compromised. And with all due respect to this building committee and to all the groups that have worked with them and have come up with two plans now and thousands of hours worth of work, there's things about this plan I just don't like. It's compromised. Um, I, I, and I have a short list of things I'd like to go through. Now, some are questions and some are just comments, but I don't think 
I see a solution for security here that I feel comfortable with, um, that I understand, that I think is adequate, state of the art, or sets the precedent or the standard for the town of Fairfield. We talked about air quality. Um, whether it's temperature control, HVAC work, or whether it's quality of air, and I think you just addressed a little, a little bit of that, I'm not convinced yet that the overall air temperature, HVAC considerations for this school under this plan tonight, I'm not talking about the plan we saw three months ago, I'm talking about this plan tonight, are addressed properly or efficiently. I think they're compromised. The bus and the parent drop-off situation. I mean, kudos to everyone for chipping in after the snow and figuring it out and making it work. But what I don't know is under this new configuration, does that plan still work? Do we have the resources to do it? Is it safe? Is it secure? Is it the right thing to do? That needs work. That needs traffic studies or that needs a study with the police department. Um, you can't expect your staff to figure that out forever. There needs to be a plan that's part of the site that's efficient, that's safe, that makes it flow and keeps the kids from potential disasters. I'm troubled by the gymnasium. We have a gym that we looked at back in December, November, or January that would have been adequate for 504 kids. Now I'm looking at a gym now that's been scaled back and we're still putting 504 kids in the building, but I don't know how this gymnasium suits the needs and delivers the programs for 504 students. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I really don't know. There's no stage. I'm, I'm, you know, and again, Mr. Quinn, I've already apologized. I'm going down the road of the compromise that you guys have made in addition to all the hard work and I'm expressing some of my concerns about what I'm looking at tonight in support of what you're doing, not as yeah. criticism. Um, I really don't know why we would spend $15 million scale back a gym and not put a stage in the gym. I don't get it. Um, you, you can roll out things all day, you can, you can do this, you can do that, but you know, geez, if we're going to build a school, fix a school, renovate a school, make it modern, make it right, I mean, it needs, a, it needs some type of um, stage. It needs somewhere where you can deliver a music program, a, a, a theater program, or whatever you're trying to do. And I don't see that here, so that, that troubles me. It really does. Um, and I don't know enough about it, I'm not a construction guy, but I'm still troubled in general by the pods being there, you know? They're an add-on, they're sufficient, they work. I don't hate them like I do a portable because the portables are very, very bad. Um, but they're still kind of an add-on. So I'm looking at this saying, wow, I'm going to spend $15 million and I'm still going to have a bunch of pods. Now, they're not as bad as the portables, but is that is that what we want? Do we want to have pods attached to this school when we're done and when we finish it $15 million later? And I just don't know if the answer is yes, at least in my mind today. Maybe I need to better understand it, but I much better liked the other plan that had two stories, that was more bricks and mortar, that got away from the pods and the portables, and seemingly away from some of these other peripheral issues that I'm now noticing with this particular plan. So what I would like to, what I want to know, I know there's dirt issues and soil issues, and I don't know a thing about dirt and soil, but some way there's got to be a way to go back to that plan and build it. You can build anything. What I don't know is what it's going to cost. Okay, I look at that plan and I say, okay, okay, the soil's bad. It's gonna, it's causing this problem and that problem, and it's going to cost this and it's going to cost that. I don't know those answers. So I look at it and I say, you know. Is it 50 bucks or is it 5 million bucks? I don't know. If I had my druthers, I would build the other plan. And I wouldn't compromise on all of these issues and a number of other issues that I think I'm seeing and feeling are compromised. So I support fixing the school and I support if, if this is all we have and this is all we can do, then, then maybe it's an okay. But I think we can do better. So that's it. Thank you. Any comments? Um, I would, would like to. I have a few kind of random comments and um, and then would like to kind of follow on what um, Select and Kylie 
I said. Yes, yeah, sorry. I have a few random comments that are not connected, but I would also like to follow up with what um, Selectman Kylie said. I did just want to comment that the comment that was made about the size of the serving line at the school is accurate. That is a very short serving line at the school, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, perhaps I should have started, not perhaps, I should have started with this at the very beginning. Um, I want to add my thanks to the building committee. Um, you are a group of people who I actually spent a fair bit of time talking to before you even got into this whole endeavor. Um, and I want to thank you all for the incredible time um, and thoughtfulness that you've put in and appreciate everything that you have done in your efforts. Um, I also just want to note that this school, as an elementary school, is very central in our district, which in terms of my thoughts and looking at um, what needs to happen here um, weighs in to my decision. Um, and I think that over time, and I'm going to use the redistricting word, which is, you know, the, the we talked about it as that's how Mrs. Iacono got involved, but this the projections in terms of numbers, it's not necessarily full, full to capacity. I think that's something I'm just going to name here. If we're going to invest in this facility and do a project that we need to um, keep that in mind as we go forward, you know, at the inevitable time when redistricting does come back um, before the Board of Education. Um, I appreciate Selectman Kiley's comments and, and some of the things that he said. And I, when I was thinking more broadly about this project as opposed to the specifics, because I think we all have specific questions that we've been talking about here. One of the things that came to mind was the conversation we had at the capital planning workshop, um, which was about a philosophical issue in terms of how we go forward with school projects. And I think what Selectman Kylie, um, that you're saying is to go into this school and to look at all of these different pieces and yet still have some of the things that you're not comfortable with, some of which that you brought up are things that I would share um, as concerns that we're doing a disservice is what I, I hear you saying. To a degree. Okay. Yeah. So, and there's that philosophical issue of do we, if we're going to address this school and the, the very real needs that are in this building and in this community, do we look at all of those pieces together and say we're, we're going to fund this at a level that addresses all of the needs in the way that we see fit and proper as a community, of course decided by the three boards that will vote on that, versus the idea of compromise on the finances, because that's a reality. We're in the middle of budget season. We are certainly in the middle of a difficult economy and we have had to compromise on many levels in terms of our finances and do we say given where we are at this point in time in the economy do we recognize that there's only so much that we're able to do now so that we will address a portion i not even specific to the project but i think that general philosophical conversation um, is worthwhile just because you know you can go to the point what Selectman Kylie is saying um, about the I'm going to use the bus line which I picked on in, <laughs> in other projects as well not just here um, certainly I it's the question for me about the staffing resource I don't know how sustainable that is none of us can really predict that for certain what I know about a built environment that allows for a physical solution, that has a level of sustainability that is more certain to me. And so I guess that's something that I'd, I'd like for us to, to talk about a little bit, that, that philosophy, because the other piece of, of compromise and you know looking at the finances, which of course is a reality for all of us, is um, and I wasn't there at the Board of Education meeting, but the chairman um, recognized that we have, that we know that there are other needs at other school communities, and that we've had issues that have come up that were unexpected um, this year, certainly with our PCBs at Osborne Hill, and we know that we have issues that we have to address at Ludlow, the, uh, the roof at Ludlow, and the windows at Ludlow, 
and space <coughs> issues as well there. Um, so these are some of the things that I'm thinking about as we're having this conversation. Um, and I find it a difficult conversation to have, but one that I think is important. I think that we need to decide from a philosophical standpoint on some level at this board, um, are we willing to compromise? Are we willing to, to have some of those compromises occur so that we can do a project that is um, fiscally palatable and doable for our community? Um, or do we say that we want to make sure that we do the right project and we want to wait that as we've been waiting for six years I know and I know again this has happened on many school projects um, sometimes that has uh, not worked out so well for us so I just I'd be interested to hear the, the thoughts of my fellow Point board members Mr. Quinn Point of information. the bond proposals that are going to stand mm -hmm. uh, 15.1 Right. Includes the larger gym. I understand. And central air. Yep. Okay. What we proposed to you was that it's needed to make sacrifices right. financially. We would cut those two things to come in at 14. Thank but you. The bond proposal does include. It does. Thank you. The. Um, let me just echo what's, what's been said. One is that the, the building committee, I think, has done a tremendous job on this. And, and I want to thank Mr. Quinn personally, uh, both for his leadership, but also for his communication in terms of uh, keeping me up to speed. And we've had a number of discussions uh, as uh, he's kind of updated me on, on the different cycles of analysis through here. I think that uh, uh, both my colleagues have raised good points. I think they're, uh, Kevin, you also raised a number of follow-up points during your earlier questions and comments in terms of Please, yes. um, mm -hmm. information you'd like to see on this. Um, uh, there, the, the Riverfield project has to be done. There, there are too many issues with the school. Um, the, um, I remember you know, going to elementary school here, and at, uh, not at Riverfield, but uh, too many 90 degree days back in the day. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I was a reasonably good student, and it was tough on me. So it, it uh, and I think we had that some of that same discussion around the Sherman project we just did. Um, I think that um, the staff, uh, you know, for the the given where we are, uh, given everything that's gone on in the economy, given um, you know how much talk there is about uh, uh, town employees, town workers, I think it's uh, tremendously insightful that the teachers would take it on themselves uh, to get there early, get out there in front, and, and help improve the safety of, of the uh, school system uh, by adding labor. Uh, and teachers, to the best of my knowledge, don't get paid overtime. Uh, so that's a tremendous statement to their commitment uh, to the community, uh, to the students, and, and um, to doing their job. Um, stepping back in, I think that uh, there are obviously a lot of changes. I want to thank the committee for meeting last night that, that uh, have come through. I think that uh, for me, Mr. Colley's follow-up points from earlier, and I think, Kristen, you had a, a couple follow-up points for uh, some additional information. Um, I think there are a couple important, important pieces here. One is that, um, quite simply, before I think this board votes on it, we need to hear back from the um, Board of Ed that these Ed specs are acceptable. Um, I think that uh, I want to thank you for uh, realizing that we need to take it there, but I really think we need to take it to the Board of Ed uh, to hear back on that. Second, I would really like to hear back that, that the two con consultants on the PCBs have talked and that we kind of have our hands around that. With the best available information today, I'm not requesting testing, but if we have walked through the school, if we have done some indicators on that uh, chlorine-based test, I'm going to call it, I realize that may not be the technical name, that that would be good to share with the, the building committee. Uh, I also, in this, in this uh, new world we live in, uh, would like to, uh, and I realize this information can't be shared, but I think it's very appropriate that the uh, building committee or some subset thereof 
have a chance to meet with our police team, uh, review the security plan for this, and incorporate their thoughts and comments into this. Because if we're going to make any changes, let's make them now. And if it, if there is a cost impact, let's comprehend that now, um, rather than later, because that's too important um, not to do and not to do right. It would, uh, I think I'm echoing what Mr. Kiley said earlier, but uh, the plus and minuses on the cost analysis from the last project, this one, I think you call it a bridge report? Yeah, that would help. Um, that would be very helpful. I just, we moved $2 million out, we moved a $1 million in, and considering the size of the project, one, I, I want to compliment you on finding how to get $2 million out. We did move a $1 million back in, mm -hmm. and that's not, um, I'm not questioning that per se, other than with numbers that size, I'd, I'd like to see it, and I think our board would be more comfortable seeing it um, laid out from that standpoint. Um, the space change analysis was... The, thank you. The space change analysis, one of that, Jen, are you capturing some of these so we can have a, a point list for the committee so we're not... Um, the, and I guess two points. One, I'm assuming that the, uh, Mr a question for you or um, whoever you're directed to that the the current gym the smaller gym that does not fit the whole school population what is the capacity of that gym we'd have to get back to you okay if if you could, if we could add that to the list, because I think that yeah, that addresses part of that the that Mr. Kyle was asking. Yeah. Um, and I would be, and, and given we're going to be getting back with some information, it might be helpful to have the school population data tied back into that, the school projections. Let me rephrase that, school projections. We have those. Um, as part of that. And again, um, I think that when you look at projects like this, I think that, that um, you know, uh, I've, for, for both this school, but for our town in general, when you look at the amount of dollars we spend from our town budget on education, we're really in the education business. When 60 to 70 percent of our dollars are all about uh, our school system and maintaining the quality of that, uh, we definitely want to do it, it right from that standpoint. Um, and when you're talking numbers this big in this economy, it makes sense to make sure that we're doing it right and we're making that those decisions with as much information as possible. And it sounds like a lot of the information that we're talking about is available. It's just not in the room today if I'm... Uh, and to the extent that we can with the follow-up points, uh, we'll get something back to the building committee on that. But if we can get that to this board ahead of time, so we have time to be able yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question for you based on that. Uh, Please, if you could just again speak to the mic so you can hear that. You asked for the whether the board the board of ed would approve the changes, and we have the two different options. One is to leave it as it is, the 15.1 million. The other is to reduce it. So the 15.1, from what I understand, is already okay with the board. So do you want us to get uh, information for the reduction further reduction to the 13? nine scheme is that what you're looking for yeah the, okay the, the, and again because of the time and because of the efforts that you've gone through to um, make this as cost effective as possible and still meet the ed spec what I'm hearing was that uh, and, and in mr. Quinn's memo from earlier today and again thank you for giving us the update on that um, is that in order to make any of these adjustments uh, there were compromises made the ed spec the question is are those uh, within the, the, the Board of Ed's. One of my questions to the Board of Ed is kind of what are the A items, what are the B items, how does this break out in terms of what's what's needed? We went through, uh, again, your committee did uh, a yeoman's job in January and said, look, here are the Ed specs. In order to meet all the Ed specs, this is how much money we have to spend. Now there's an option that, that we may not need to meet those specs versus what these specs are. So I think it's in our fiduciary responsibility just to confirm that we know what things we have to spend on versus we don't versus what are recommended. So I think from that standpoint, very definitely. If there are any items, uh, and beyond that, if there are any items in this Ed spec that are not required, uh, part of our question back to the Board of Ed will be to identify which ones aren't A items so that we have a, the ability to identify those. Uh, 
uh, within that framework. That being said, I was going to make a motion, but if there are any no, I'm good. comments, I'm, I'm, I'm just good. follow up. I think that the, that sense of A item, B item goes back to my to my comments about the philosophical direction. So it, I think what you're you're talking about one kind of level of that A item, B item, and one that level would be A is these we have to do these. These are things we must do. But there's another level of that A, B that would be, I'm, I'm prioritizing, right? Say that list of alterations, let's just say that was in priority order. It, it's, from, I don't, it's not, right? It's not, okay. But let's just say that we put those in priority order. Again, whether, whatever this board does in terms of passing it on, we know that there are many other people who are gonna be involved in this conversation, so. Um, I, I think having some sense of, of that, I, you know, I'm wondering if that's something that you're interested in. And that, again, goes to my philosophical um, question of do we want to do we want to look at those A, B pieces and, you know, I mean, I, I, I see merits to both and I'm not sure, um, but is that something that I, I think for. for me, the simplest answer is the devil's in the details. The, the, we can have a large philosophical discussion on that, and the, at one point, if the money's available, you do it all at once. If the money's not available, then you may have decisions to make. But I think whether you make those decisions and whether you do it all at once or uh, potentially don't is all based on the school, the project, and, and what's taking place. I, I, I don't know if I could come up with a general rule, at least from my personal perspective, Philosophically, I could go either way based on the project, but it's it's all for me project dependent. Kevin, I, would I don't know about. I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I think the information would be helpful before the, that philosophical discussion. So, which which information that all those pieces, but in terms of that A B list, would that would that be something that you would find helpful in terms of okay, we have to do these. Obviously, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I say that recognizing how difficult that is and how almost uh, and I see the response that I am seeing on people's faces I say it recognizing I'm sitting at the Board of Finance budget table listening to the conversation and recognizing the reality of what the elected officials are facing what the taxpayers are facing what the students are facing what the teachers are facing and compromise though I think Mr. Kiley, Select McKiley talked about you know, kind of the negative sense of compromised in terms of things he was concerned about, which is a fair way to use that word. Another way to talk about compromise is we're going to have to compromise in our community this year in particular um, in terms of the various responsibilities that we have to the community. So that's why I raised this. I just, I want to have an honest conversation about that. And I couldn't agree more that this project absolutely has to get done as well. There are significant needs that need to be addressed. So, thank you. Thank you. I think, and I think the other component of that is what's happening overall. Uh, as much as we're focused on Riverfield here today, um, we need to look at the whole environment. The, the, we've absorbed the PCB issue at Osborne Hill. We've got the Storm Sandy components. We've got Riverfield. Um, I hear that there's a project for uh, Ludlow High School that will be in front of us shortly uh, and there are other projects coming down so that the part of the reason for doing the capital planning workshop part of the reason for looking at the, the larger picture is not just one project uh, but both PCBs and Storm Sandy were not on our horizon um, even six months ago well no they were about a year ago if you go back 12 months ago we didn't have the PCBs uh, on our horizon uh, we didn't and certainly didn't know the cost within the last six months so I think those are, uh, Chris, and your point, I mean, that's the reason for having a capital plan. That's the reason for doing the capital planning workshop to have some of that discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's yeah, the reason for, makes sense. now that we know some of the costs, to go back to the Board of Ed uh, and say, are some of those cost components at alternates that are being proposed by the committee within, this, within their view of the specs, and can they be changed to do that? But, and at this point, they also know the cost. When they developed the ed specs, they were not aware of what the cost implications of all those were. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, so they can see that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it, it um, for our discussion and looking at um, what we need to do here, we can vote for this, vote against it, um, postpone it, or take no action with a first step in the process. So the difference mm -hmm. between postponing it and taking no action is, I think, uh, pretty minimal. Um, but that would let the committee get back to us with the follow-up points on information. With your permission, would let me uh, make our request to the Board of Ed on the, the specs, specs and priority, <coughs> uh, which, if nothing else, will let us have that discussion, but also let the building committee know uh, some better guidance on that. Mm -hmm. And let us have a fuller discussion next time this comes back. And can we, just to reiterate, can we add to the list to be clear? And I know it was my request, but I'm, I'm still concerned. Well, I, I would still like to know what it would cost to build the other building, give or take some change, even if it's a rough estimate. Yeah. Mr. Conway, could you just specify other buildings so it's clear the here? The first proposal that we saw with the two story addition. Scheme four. Scheme four, is that what it was called? Because it, I'm just still generally concerned that we're now willing to spend $15 million, and I understand the reasons, but I'm just still generally concerned that we're willing now to, willing now to spend that much money and leave in place something that we wanted to tear down only a few months ago. So I just want to understand the implications, the reasons, the rationale, the challenges, and the finances, and it could very well may be that we come that I come back to this and say, it's good. Um, but I'm just not there. And just to clarify your, your question, Mr. Conn, if I can, based on what we had before, we had it, an approximate price of $15 million for the prior plan before Gilbane got involved right. and before we did the testing on the soil yeah. right. uh, for the uh, good right. dirt, good dirt, bad dirt. Yeah. I know that's not the technical. <laughs> uh, but those are those both the rough plan, so that's the rough cost. Right. But two major, I'm going to say changes or impacts since then. We also so. added the kitchen line, second line, and the stage out. So mm. that's also Okay. Line so, line. well, the stage was in the first plan. The stage was in, in the larger gym. Uh, the, the, the stage, the stage. Was it? No, no, I mean in the uh, cafeteria. Oh, the cafeteria, yeah. second one. Okay. The cafeteria. Oh, okay. I would just like to see what, what, can that be done and what it would cost? Because be in, at least in my mind, that that plan like, solved more problems. Yeah, so okay. My concern is Without slowing you guys down, I'm not looking to well, do that. I'm not looking to. You know. We are being slowed down. Okay, very honestly. If we don't get a positive vote tonight, okay, we're being slowed down, and we're jeopardizing a half a million dollars that we put in this plan, okay, to expedite it and save the money that would have been wasted. Okay. And I'm concerned about that. What I ask is, is there a way that your process could get back to us so that we can make up some time? I can get you most of this stuff by the end of the week. If, you know, if I have to wait till April to your next meeting, then I, then I go, bing, bing. I get too far behind. Well, yeah, April's in two weeks. Well, I know. But, but I, I think that was actually going to be one of my questions and why I pulled out my calendar. But in terms of advancing this on to other boards, if I'm not mistaken, we meet April 3rd. We do. If, if it were to be... There's, uh, not, there's not a board of finance, regularly scheduled board of finance meeting in April, I don't believe. April 2nd, I believe. That's... Second. 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 April 2nd, I just checked this afternoon. Yeah, I, I don't believe that's the case. Okay. That's the Board true. of Finance April. is meeting on April 2nd, yes. to be clear, mm -hmm. but that's when they discuss and vote on the budget. That's right. That's not a regularly scheduled meeting. Right. The best of my knowledge, and we'll, right. Jen, if we can confirm that, but I believe that's the yeah, case. So right, I think. I, I believe they still have on the calendar their quarterly meeting in April, which is typically the third, and I should know this, the third, <laughs> the third Wednesday of the month or the third Tuesday of that particular month. So I don't know if there's a way to weave it into that schedule or okay. not. Maybe, that, maybe not. That wouldn't get it to the RTM in April. Mm, no, I guess it wouldn't. Yeah, that's true. RTM meeting's the 22nd. It's moved up this year. 
and it's also all this vacation their, in there. And it's also their budget scheduling right. meeting. It is. So that's a challenge. Um, so that that's going to be a just tough part for them. Here, let's let's do this. Yeah. The calendar's the calendar, yeah. and special meetings have been called before. Yeah. However, to make that argument, then you, I think we need a timeline that shows why a given date and what the milestones are sure. and what the dates are that, that yes, would, sure. would matter yeah. on that side. Because um, the Board of Ed has their still right. kind and we of need, And as we well. do need to hear back from the Board of Ed on that. Right. Please. And I guess I just want to reiterate still that whether we vote tonight or the third, doesn't impact because of the way that the of the timing of those meetings so but I, I agree a timeline would be helpful so that we understand the full impact of what you're saying mr. Quinn sure and, and what that might sense. mean right. any other comments from here no sir uh, I guess my proposal yeah. would be we take no action on this right now okay. so we're not uh, locked into uh, moving to a fixed date and because we're the first step in the process, we can take it up whenever. Mr. Quinn, to your point, because there are three of us, unlike other bodies, uh, there's less, less less coordination, and we can schedule a special meeting if we need to to do that. Um, but I think we need to get get that information back, get the response back from the Board of Ed. Um, and Jen, if we can get that follow-up list uh, out on a very timely basis so we can get that to Mr. Quinn. I think Phil wants to talk. Yes. Our next regular meeting is April 9th, yeah. uh, but we could also hold a special meeting as soon as we get a letter from you that says there are questions so that have a few lines. Just to save Mr. Dwyer the walk up to the mic, I'm going to repeat that Mr. Dwyer has graciously offered <laughs> uh, that as soon as they get uh, a letter from our board that um, they will consider uh, adjusting their schedule to meet on a timely basis to meet whatever the schedule. And again, that's probably where that, that timeline is very important. All right. Um, so if we take no action on this, we don't have to do anything at this point, and we can move on to our next agenda item, uh, and we will do the appropriate uh, write-ups from there. Uh, to the building committee, I want to thank you again. Uh, that was a lot of information we went through, and I appreciate how quickly you've moved on this. Can I sign those at a later date? I'm late for a meeting. Yeah. I've got my attorney on the phone. Well, we'll call Can I speak by tomorrow or Friday? Okay. Well, let's take, can we yep. So discuss thank what you. I tax collector. Thanks, guys. Okay. So I have not had a chance. So you want to take no action on eight? Let's take no action on eight either. Let's just, or, or, or do you want to? Oh, there's one on? that I have a question on. So can we? Because I'm like hours. Can I told the guys yeah, I'd be home. Okay, why don't we postpone to postpone to the, the uh, date yeah, certain I'm the next uh, board of selectmen meeting. Yes, yeah, make thank you. Second, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, no new communications and uh, no new business. Good. Motion, motion to, to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So.